All right, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for being here. Um, just a quick note. I sent out an email today as well, but there was a mistake on the syllabus before. Maybe you caught it where I missed it. There used to not be a lecture 4A on the syllabus, and there was a whole bunch of stuff in lecture 3B, which is today. So I split those two things up and we'll see how far we get today, whether or not we get to this, um, uh, to the Rankin cycle example or not. So, um, I know we just wrote the first exam, but it's time to start thinking about the second exam too, since we do two weeks uh, every, every week, right? Um, I know we had an exam on Monday last time. I am thinking about having the exam not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. I have a family commitment in the, excuse me, in the evening on the 25th. Um, it would be possible to run the exam uh, without me sort of, you know, being totally hands off. But I know if we would have done that uh, last time, then we would have had a lot of problems with people not being able to access the exam. So I'd prefer to be uh, able to watch things on the computer. So my plan is to have the exam on July the 27th. So I would appreciate it if you can uh, check your calendars and let me know if that does not work because we will pick a different day or at least um, potentially have different access for people writing different exams if the 27th doesn't work for you. So please let me know uh, what's going on, hopefully by the end of this week, but I will put up a reminder of this again on Tuesday as well. So uh, we'll jump right into things. Um, okay, so obviously if you don't have Wi-Fi access, it's not, not a great um, situation to be in. So we can certainly have you write um, on a different day. We'll see if we end up writing the whole, having the whole class write on a different day, but we'll, we'll certainly accommodate that. Um, so we're going to talk about how we find specific entropy. So in the last class, we talked about this idea of the second law and how entropy is not conserved, but in order to do an analysis using that second law, then um, it's helpful, uh, necessary actually, for us to find specific entropy in different cases. All right, so we introduced this, this rate equation for the second law, right? And remember the whole thing about the second law is that this entropy generation rate is always positive if a process is possible. Right, so we know that um, if this is negative, the process is definitely not possible. Um, even if you get an answer of zero, the process is still not possible, but that's kind of a special case. It's the limit of what's possible, so we call that the ideal process. Of course, in order to figure out an answer for sigma dot to get a number here, we're going to need to know specific entropy of different fluids at different states, right? So just like in the first law, and sometimes even for conservation of mass, if we need to find the specific volume, we've got to ask ourselves, what's the fluid in order to fix the state so we can put numbers into our equation. So the first half or the first part of this uh, lecture today, we'll talk about how we find S in different cases, right? So again, anytime we're trying to find any of these properties, whether it's H or S or U or V, we've got to ask ourselves, what's the fluid? Because if I know what the fluid is, then I got a chance, I can systematically go through and figure out how to find any of these properties, right? So if the answer to what's the fluid is water or something like it, like a refrigerant, that goes back and forth across the vapor dome where we're boiling it and condensing it, then I need to know what the phase is, right? And, and a lot of these are easy, right? Because it's basically the same as finding any of the other properties, right? So if it's a superheated vapor and it's water, right? So if we're talking about steam, then I would go into table A4 in the textbook and I would look it up in the same way that I do linear interpolation for U or H. If it's a two-phase material, then just like any other property under the vapor dome, except temperature and pressure, I need to know what the quality is. Hopefully, 
they just tell me the quality. But if they don't tell me the quality, maybe they tell me the temperature and the specific volume, then I need to find out what the quality is and then put that into my quality equation. And then I can find U or H or now specific entropy or little s. If it's a subcooled liquid, I really have two options here, right? The first is I can do a table lookup, but just like for all those other properties, remember this would be table A5 if we're talking about water, and that table doesn't even really start until pressures that are pretty high. Off the top of my head, I want to say something like maybe 25 bar or something like that, a very high, a pretty high pressure. So um, we could do, you know, could use that. Often we'll need double interpolation because those tables are pretty sparse, right? So if this was a subcooled liquid and we were talking about H or U and I just wanted to find one value, then I would say, oh, S is approximately equal to SF. And we can still do that, although it's not on the slide. But you'll remember that for liquids, we could talk about delta u being cp times delta t or cv times delta t i'm sorry and delta h being cp times delta t although for liquids cp and cv are the same thing for delta s it's pretty similar it's just instead of cp times delta t it's really cp times the change in the natural logs so instead of cp times t2 minus t1 it's cp times the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 1. but remember natural logs have this special property that if i have the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 1 i can get the same answer if i take the natural log of t2 over t1. so if i'm trying to find delta s and it's liquids on both sides and i know the temperatures then i can use this equation and it's nice because I don't need to look stuff up in the tables, right? But I could also take SF at T2 minus SF at T1. So I guess really there's three options we have here. One thing that I will caution you about though, is in this equation, these are not temperature differences in the numerator or the denominator, right? So you know what I'm gonna say, right? You get a very different answer if you have zero degrees Celsius or 273 degrees Kelvin. So you have to use absolute temperatures anytime you have an equation that has T's but not delta T's, right? So here you have to use absolute temperatures if you're going to use that formula. Here's where things get more difficult because everything else, you know, for water, it's basically the same right except we have a little bit different in subcooled liquids but it's almost the same right but for ideal gases we have new strategies right so here again there's three different options if you're talking about variable specific heat right this is you know so if you were finding delta h for variable specific heat you'd have to go to table a22 you know the temperature and if you know the temperature, you can move over on that table, A22, and say, oh, I know T, so I know H. We can do something similar for ideal gases if we're trying to find specific entropy, but it's not the same. Specific entropy for ideal gases is a function of both temperature and pressure. That's what this equation tells us. So the textbook, if you look it up on table A22, it's only got temperatures there. The textbook doesn't care what your pressure is. So in that case, it's only going to tell you this S superscript zero value. And from that, you know, by itself, it's not really that important. You can't really use it for anything, right? But if you have two temperatures, you can find the change in S superscript zero, right? So that will tell you the change in the specific entropy that's a result of the change in pressure, which is part of the total change in specific entropy. 
So this S superscript zero thing, you can look it up on the table, but you're not finished because it only tells you the change in the specific entropy that happens because the temperature changes. There's also some other part of the change in specific entropy that has to do with the pressure. Right, so here we take R, remember that's the specific gas constant. This is the same R that's in our ideal gas law, which is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass. If you're not given this specific gas constant or R on an, on an exam, you can find it or calculate it by looking up R bar, which is on the first page of our reference materials, that PDF that has um, all the tables that we need for the course. And then you divide by the molar mass, which you can find on table A1 if it's metric, or A1e if it's an English or imperial version of the problem. And then we have this natural log of P2 over P1. Notice that if this is S2 minus S1, it's the first value that goes in the numerator and the second value that goes in the denominator. Right? So this is our the, really the only option that we have if it's variable specific heat. Right? So I can find these S superscript zero values in the textbook on table A23 or A23E if it's English units or imperial units. Right, so S is a function of both temperature and pressure, and that's what this equation tells us. S superscript zero is not the whole thing, right? But it does tell us how much of that temperature or how much of that change in specific entropy is because of the temperature change. Right? But then if the pressure changes, you still have to add that other piece, right? Notice here, right, that if the pressure does not change, right, so if P2 is equal to P1. This term goes away because the natural log of one is zero, right? So if you have um, an isobaric process, one where the pressure doesn't change, then this term goes away because if the pressure doesn't change, the specific entropy change that happens because of pressure is zero. Right? Now we have two other options that come up if it's a constant specific heat problem. Remember, constant specific heat for ideal gas. If we were trying to find delta U for a closed version of the first law, we would say CV times delta T. If we were trying to find delta H, we would say CP times delta T. And for ideal gases, unlike incompressible material like liquids or solids, CP and CV are different. So it's important that you get it right for um, ideal gases. My advice is just you know, have a copy of that equation sheet that I prepared for the class um, available to you because we've been using that equation sheet for, you know, almost a decade since I've been here. And, uh, you know, those equations are correct. So, you know, you, you don't have to worry about whether or not you wrote them down right or wrong. Right? So this is a similar equation here. So this is the equation that we use if we know the temperature and the pressure. And it's still got two parts. One part is still due to the change in temperature. One part is still due to the change in pressure. Right? So here we've still got a temperature part and a pressure part. But now, instead of looking up the temperature part on the tables, we use this approximation. That, so this is saying basically that that delta S superscript zero is approximately equal to CP times the natural log of T2 over T1. Right? And then the, this pressure term is exactly the same pressure term that we saw in the other equation. Right? So this is similar. In this, usually in open systems, we would use this equation. Because in an open system... I'll typically know the pressures and the temperatures. Again, notice the temperatures here are not temperature differences, so they have to be absolute temperatures, right? Not Celsius or Fahrenheit. That's true of the pressures as well, that the pressures have to be absolute pressures, but all the pressure and not gauge pressures, but all the pressures we give you in this class 
will be absolute pressure. So you don't have to think about that as much in the class. But if you were doing this in real life, then you'd want to know if it's a gauge pressure or an absolute pressure. Right? Not that a class isn't real life, right? Um, right? So, um, but if you're talking about closed systems, right? Like, like we did in the first half of the class, right? We're talking about a piston cylinder assembly and the piston is moving up and down. Often you'll know the volumes and not necessarily the pressures. So if you're in a case where you know the temperatures and the specific volumes, then you would use this version of the equation, which is almost the same. But now we say that this change in the specific entropy, it's still a function of two different things, right? But instead of temperature and pressure, now it's temperature and specific volume. You'll notice the shape of the equation here looks pretty close to the same thing. It's a specific heat times the natural log of T2 over T1. Still, you know, the, one, the numerator is the first number and the denominator is the second number, right? Or the temperature related to that state. But the, it's CV and not CP. And then we have another term that's a function of that specific gas constant, right? But now volumes instead of pressures. And we add this term instead of subtracting. So um, these are our two different options if it's constant specific heat. So we really have three different equations, one for variable specific heat, where it has that S superscript zero thing you're going to find on table A22 or A22E, and then two for constant specific heat, one that we're normally going to use for open systems because we'll usually know temperatures and pressures, and one that we'll usually use for closed systems because we'll normally know temperatures in specific volumes. So just like all cases where we're assuming constant specific heat, we sort of gain the advantage of time, not having to look things up on these tables, but we gain the disadvantage of accuracy because um, really, this model, this specific heat times the natural log of the ratio of temperatures, um, isn't as accurate as the tabulated data, right? So like so many things in engineering, you're gaining maybe um, time, right? Which is analogous to cost, right? But you're sacrificing inaccuracy, right? So if you can use the tables, the tables are more accurate. Right, so if you're using tables, that's the air standard analysis or variable specific heat. And if you're using these equations, then it's constant specific heat or sometimes called a cold air standard analysis. Now, the way that I remember that, right, is that any time I write down an equation that has a specific heat in it, I need to write down the assumption that I'm assuming that the specific heat is constant. Right, because otherwise um, I would have to integrate that CP or CV over some temperature range and I'd need to know the function. Right, so um, this is from uh, the FE exam, I think this, but right, but these are the same equations, right? So if it's constant specific heat where we're sacrificing accuracy, then these are the equations, right? So um, ideal gas, remember the thing we have to ask ourselves, right, the reason What's a fluid is a two-part question. When I say, oh, it's an ideal gas, then what I need to do is say, is it constant specific heat or variable specific heat? And if it's constant specific heat, I'm never going to find the individual U values or the individual H values or the individual S values. Instead, I'm modeling all of these things with the equations that are here. Right? So I'm gaining speed but losing accuracy. So we'll walk through a bit of an example. <clears throat> we talked about this example last time when we were doing a first law analysis, right? And remember, I talked about how, you know, heat exchangers are oftentimes the trickiest control volumes because there's really three choices of control volume that we can make here, right? 
One of them is the entire control volume, which includes, in this case, the air side, which is the hot side because it's cooling down, and the refrigerant side, which is the cold side because it's heating up. Right? Um, but I could do the air side separately, and I could do the refrigerant side separately. So I'm going to show you that um, I can do... Right, so if I'm doing a second law analysis on this problem, the reason I'm doing it is to ask, is this process possible? What's the sign of that sigma dot term? Right. So what I can do is I can do the same thing on those same three control volumes and we'll see what kind of answers we get. Right. Now we already did part of this problem, although maybe we didn't exactly do it in class. Maybe it's just in the notes, but we found the mass flow rate of air the mass flow rate of refrigerant and the heat transfer from the air to the refrigerant, right? So the air is losing heat to the refrigerant, so that's uh, negative. So if I drew my little stick person here in the air region, feels like, well, we are losing heat. But if I drew my stick person in the refrigerant, we would be gaining heat. So it depends on what your perspective is, what the sign of that heat transfer is, right? So here the question is, is this process possible? Now, if that's a question that I have, one of the ways that I can answer that problem is, what's the sign of sigma dot, right? So we're gonna do this analysis first by looking at the entire system. I like looking at the entire system in a case like this, because we're gonna see, just like when we did conservation of energy, that if I look at the whole system, this heat transfer term can go away because I'm probably going to assume that I'm not losing any heat to the outside world, that all the heat that comes out of the air goes into the refrigerant. And I like doing a second law analysis when it's adiabatic because if this heat transfer term sticks around, I got to get the sign of the heat transfer right which is gonna be the same sign as for the first law in that same control volume. And then I gotta get the temperature right. That temperature has to be not a temperature inside my control volume, but it has to be also a temperature that's in Kelvin or Rankin and not Celsius or Fahrenheit, right? So if I can cancel that term out, I think my life becomes a little easier. Although in this case, it means I gotta fix four states. Right? So if I look at the whole system, I'll say that it's at steady state. So that differential term goes away. This is an assumption. Let's say you're doing the open system um, exam. So the second midterm and you just totally blank, right? Always what you can do is write down these governing equations, these rate equations, and you can at least tell me I'm going to assume it's steady state because in this class, it's always steady state. And sometimes I think, you know, doing something like that or drawing a state table or doing a TS diagram, it kind of just gets the juices flowing, right? It builds up some inertia. So you start to do some work and, you know, our brains are amazing things. And in the back of your head, your brain is going to be churning away on the problem. And just if you can take your mind off the fact that it's like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing you know, the answer bubbles to the top a lot of times, right? So just, that's why I love having a great process. If I have a robust process, I can just start doing it, right? And let the wheels turn a little bit. Like I said, if I look at the whole system, I can say that it's adiabatic. And the reason for that is that while there is heat transfer going from the air into the refrigerant, what I'm saying here is none of that heat crosses the boundary of my control volume. So that while, yes, heat is leaving the air, I'm saying it's all going into the refrigerant, that I've insulated the heck out of this, out of this uh, heat exchanger, so no heat is going to the environment. Because of that, because I'm looking at both sides, I can't cancel out either of my summation terms. I have to deal with all four ports. So I have two inlets and two outlets. I can't get rid of those summation signs. That's the price that I pay for getting rid of that heat transfer term. Right. So now I always sometimes if I go too quickly in these kind of problems, sometimes I screw this sign up 
because I forget that all this stuff is on the same side of the equation. So now here, when I'm solving for sigma dot, because that's the term I'm trying to find, because I want to know if it's positive or negative, sometimes I forget that I have to move this stuff to the other side of the equation. So this becomes the sum of the mass flow rates out, S out, minus the sum of the mass flow rates in, S in. So that's one of those things you can sort of be on the lookout for when you're doing these types of problems. Right, so we can break this out. We know that um, if I look just at the air side, that the air side mass flow rate is the same, right? Because this is like Ghostbusters. We're not crossing the streams. All the air that goes in at the air inlet, state one, has to come out at the air outlet, state two, because the air side is steady state with one inlet and one outlet. So conservation of mass for this problem, if you remember, told us that m dot one was equal to m dot two. And the same thing is true for m dot three and four. That's our refrigerant mass flow rate. Both of these terms are out minus in. So what I did here, right, even though in this part of the equation, this is the sum of the outlets and the sum of the inlets, I don't group them as inlets and outlets. Instead, I group them by mass flow rate, right? So here I turned this into the air mass flow rate, S out minus S in, and the refrigerant mass flow rate, S out minus S in, right? So, um, so that gives me this equation, and it's great because I want to. I I know m dot a. I know m dot r. Sigma dot's the thing I'm trying to solve for. I don't know any of these s's yet. Right? But if I could only fix the states, then I'd be able to have an answer for what I'm trying to do. Right? Um, if you were looking at a multiple choice question on an exam. You might not actually need a number because all this is asking is, is it possible? This problem is not asking what's the entropy generation rate. So if I had an equation like this and both terms were positive, then I say, oh yeah, then it's going to be possible. If both terms were negative, oh no, process is not possible. If one term is positive and one term is negative, then I kind of got to do the math to see which term is bigger. Um, and in a heat exchanger problem like this, the thing that's heating up, entropy is increasing. The thing that's cooling down, entropy is decreasing. Right? So I know the mass flow rates, but I don't know the specific entropies. Right? So now I got to kind of use that information that we were talking about before. How do I find the states? And I got to fix all these states. Right? Or at least, well, I, maybe I won't spoil the surprise. Right? So R134A is a refrigerant. Refrigerants are like water in that when we use them in the types of devices that we're talking about, they're going to bounce back and forth across the vapor dome, right? Here we have state three, which was under the vapor dome, right? We already fixed these states um, in the previous problem because we were looking for uh, the H values when we were doing the first law, right? So we know that state three is under the vapor dome. We know the temperature if we wanted to know the temperature because it has to be the boiling temperature at five bar. We know that's 15.74. I could get that from whatever the equivalent of table A3 is where the nice round pressures are on the left, but for the refrigerants, R134A, and not for, um, not for water, right? So that's this table. Here I have a five bar, right? There's my boiling temperature, 15.74. So I know that's the temperature, right? But here I got to pick, uh, I need S values now, not H values, right? Um, now we found the quality in the previous problem. We found that it was 20% vapor. So some vapor in there, but not a lot, comparatively anyway, right? So I can put this in and I get a value for S3. S3 is 0.4, and the units here for entropy on my table are kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Energy per mass per temperature. Right, so that's how I fixed state three. This is exactly how I would have found H in this same problem. So here there's not really anything new, except we're using a different column on the table. Right? So this was the state table that I had for um, finding the first law answer. 
right so now I got s I got s3 right so you know I needed four things and now I now I only need three right so I'm on the path right now the next state for the refrigerant is we know it's at 20 degrees right still five bar but 20 degrees now 20 degrees is larger than 15.74 so when I drew this on the table I see that the two pieces of information that I have the constant pressure of five bar and the constant temperature of 20 degrees Celsius those are going to meet up here in the superheated vapor region right that means I need the equivalent of table a4 for refrigerants in order to find s4 right so here I look for remember these tables are tables of tables so I got to find the one with the right pressure and thankfully I have one so I don't have to do any kind of double interpolation I know I have the right pressure right and then I want to find 20 degrees again I'm lucky almost like somebody designed this problem so that I didn't have to do interpolation right and uh, and I see that now my specific entropy here is 0.9264 this is what we expect because um, the refrigerant is heating up right and the thing that heats up we expect its specific entropy to increase right on that TS diagram we were moving from left to right and S is on the X axis so we expect this one to go up so I don't know if the numbers are right but at least qualitatively I'm confident that I'm seeing the right behavior here now for the air side I can do the air side in two different ways and I think I'll show you both right but here because the air temperature change is not that big we could use constant or variable specific heat but like we said ideal gases are tricky when we're trying to find the changes in specific entropy in both cases I have to use an equation so I'm never going to find s1 or s2 in this problem even if it's variable specific heat right so that's different for h if it was variable specific heat and I was trying to find the specific enthalpy then I would find an actual value for H at state one in state two because I just look it up right but here because I have this S superscript zero right the change in entropy because of the temperature difference and then there's also something going on with the pressure difference right so I can look up my S superscript zero terms here but then I still need the equation then if it's constant specific heat I got to pick between these two equations if I know temperatures and pressures which is usually the case for open systems then I'll pick equation B here but if I know temperatures and specific volumes which is often the case for closed systems then I would pick option C right in this case I know the temperatures and the pressures I don't know the specific volumes I could find them if I wanted to I could use the uh, ideal gas law and find them both but it's a lot of work for really no benefit because I have this equation that lets me use temperatures and pressure right so table a or option a is the most accurate of these things but option B is also pretty good here because my temperature difference is pretty small so I'm not expecting a big difference here so this is how I would solve the problem if I was going to use variable specific heat so if it's an exam and professor Schertzer told me I had to use variable specific heat that means it's code for look stuff up on table a22 in this case the thing I'm trying to look up is this s superscript zero value right notice here that there are temperatures I cut off the header here but the header will tell you these temperatures are in Kelvin Right? or Rankin if it's uh, an imperial problem anytime you have an ideal gas problem use absolute temperatures right because the ideal gas law uses absolute temperatures these tables use absolute temperatures if you're going to use Delta s you need absolute temperature like right so if it's an ideal gas problem use absolute temperatures right so this problem they told me that the inlet temperature is 32 degrees but I'm going to convert that to 305 degrees Kelvin right in one bar right so 305 is here I'm looking for s superscript zero 
If this was an exam problem, I probably wouldn't do interpolation. If they told me it was 301, I would maybe pick 300, or I would just take the average of these two numbers. If it was, you know, 304, I would probably take this number or the average in between them. I probably wouldn't go through the effort to, because the numbers are pretty close together. And we can see S superscript zero doesn't change too much, especially if it's a multiple choice question where I'm never, I don't even have to show my work, right? So the answers are probably not so close together that, um, that doing that is gonna hurt me too much, right? right. So um, my other temperature is 22 degrees Celsius, which is 295 degrees Kelvin. Right, so that's this number on the table. So I didn't have to do interpolation, right? I picked these two numbers. The pressure difference exists here. So that means that there is gonna be a pressure term. But here I have values for S superscript zero, R, maybe it's given in the problem, or I could take R bar from the first sheet on that reference page, and then I gotta to go to A1 or A1E, A1 in this case, because it's metric, and find capital M, the molar mass of air, and then find the specific gas constant. And now I know P2, P1 and P2. I put all this stuff into my calculator. Again, I like to do this all separately as much as I can, right? So I didn't just put it all in my calculator and get one answer. I have a first term and a second term. I see the first term is positive. The second term is negative. So I have... Um, an answer here for S1 minus S2, right? Although I got to remember in my equation, this is a thing too, right? In my equation, remember I, I manipulated it so it was S out minus S in, right? So this should, you know, I got to remember that this is S1 minus S2, S in minus S out. So I got to multiply by that, that by negative one when I put it into my equation, right? So here I have S1 minus S2 as this small number here, right? So now I have the mass flow rate of air. I don't actually have S2 and S1, but I have an approximation of S2 minus S1. And then I have um, this mass times these specific entropies, which I looked up in the table for the refrigerant. Right, so this is the mass flow rate was 0.95 kilograms per second. This was S1 minus S2, but I got to multiply that by negative one, right? I'm always going to check my units to make sure I'm adding apples to apples. I'm expecting the signs of these two different terms to be different because one fluid is heating up and the other fluid is cooling down, right? So here I get a negative answer for my first term. My second term, I know all of these values. So I just put them into my calculator. Again, I'm careful with my units because I put them in. Once I put numbers into my equations, I got to put units into my equations too. And I get a positive number here. I'm starting to feel pretty good about this because I know heat exchangers exist in the real world. Right? And here I see I have one positive term and one negative term, but my positive term is bigger than my negative term, which means that my entropy generation rate is positive and that's what the second law tells us is that anything that happens in the real world entropy must be being generated which means that the rate of entropy generation must be positive right so that's what i get in this case so this is possible when i look at the whole system right so that's if i can look at the whole heat exchanger right and i like looking at the whole heat exchanger because uh, because I can get rid of that um, Q dot term, right? But I forgot to talk about what would happen if I did constant specific heat, right? So with variable specific heat, right? This delta S had this S superscript zero term or this delta S superscript zero term, right? But if Dr. Schertzer on the exam says, oh, use constant specific heat, Right? Oh, now I got to use CP times the natural log of T2 over T1. Right? So I know T1, I know T2, right? I know P1 and I know P2. So I can evaluate this term. Right? This term is going to be negative, this first part of the term. 
Second part of the term, right? That's negative, but it's negative of a negative, right? So it's going to be positive, but in total, S2 minus S1 is negative, right? Which is good, because it was the other way, too, right? So from the tables, in the tables, first we found S1 minus S2, and it was 0 0.019, right? But then we had to multiply by negative 1 to get S2 minus S1, and that's what we have here. So this is good, right? It's the right answer. Or at least a very similar answer that we got um, if we were doing variable specific heat, right? And, um, and that makes sense because our temperature difference here was small. It was only like 10 degrees. If we were talking about like going through a jet engine and my temperature difference is like 1,000 degrees, then maybe, um, maybe I get a bigger um, divergence between these two answers. So that was if I just did the entire control volume. And like I said, I kind of like doing that because then I can get rid of the Q dot term. But maybe you feel better about that Q dot term than about finding S's for refrigerants. That's probably not the case because finding S's for refrigerants are basically the same as finding um, S's for, or H's for refrigerants, right? But if I did just the air side, I still get to say it's steady state but now there is a Q dot term, right? But there's only one inlet and one outlet. So the sacrifice that I'm making is that I have to incorporate this heat transfer rate term. But the benefit that I get, right? This engineering is all about trade-offs. The trade-off that I get here, the benefit is that I only have to fix two states instead of four states, right? So the summation signs go away. Again, I can find a value for sigma dot Right, but I gotta isolate it, so that means I move everything out to the other side of the equation. So the Q dot term becomes negative. I only have one mass flow rate term, this time for the air, because that's the side of the heat exchanger that I'm looking at. It's still S out minus S in. Does this part make sense, the symbolic solution part? Right, so I'm trying to figure out, is this bigger than zero? Is this process possible, right? I know Q dot, but I gotta be careful, because in the given information, it told me the air from the refrigerant. So I gotta think about what's my perspective? Well, I'm in the air side, so this is right. So it should be this negative number. So that's good, I know Q dot air. I hopefully can figure out T of the surroundings. It should be the temperature not inside my control volume. I know the mass flow rate of the air, it's given. And I already found um, an approximation for the change in the entropy of the air. Right. So here, this part we've already done, right? We did it with variable specific heat and with constant specific heat. Here, I think this was the answer from the variable specific heat number where this becomes delta S superscript zero minus R times the natural log of T2 over T1, right? This was the answer we got for that, right? So again, I know the answer for that. Now, I always got to stop and think when I'm using this uh, heat transfer rate term, right? I know the heat transfer from the air to the refrigerant is minus 9.5 kilowatts, right? Because the air is losing heat, so this should be a negative number, right? My temperature should be the temperature outside of my control volume. But the temperature of the refrigerant does not stay constant. So which temperature should I pick, right? And this, it takes a little rest. First of all, I shouldn't pick either of these two temperatures, right? Because even though these are temperatures in the refrigerants, I can't put these numbers into this equation because this is not a temperature difference. So I can't put in 15.7 or 20. I have to convert those to Kelvin, right? So that's the first thing I'm going to do. And then I have to pick. Now, these numbers are close enough together it probably doesn't matter what I pick, right? But I want to tell you how I think about picking these values. I don't know if you've heard this e expression before, but in engineering, we will often talk about making conservative assumptions, right? It has nothing to do with political affiliation. This is about picking an assumption that's like the worst case scenario. Right? So we're going to try to pick the number between these two numbers 
which one gets me further away from the desired answer, right? The desired answer here is I want to show this thing is positive. I want sigma dot to be positive, right? In this case, because my heat transfer term is negative, this whole term minus q dot over t is going to be positive, right? You see how that's, because it's a negative number times a negative number. The temperature is always a positive number no matter what, because it's an absolute temperature. So here, I want to make this positive term as small as I can. Because that way, if I get a positive number, I'll know that the answer is positive. Right? Whereas if I picked, you know, if I made the positive number as big as I could, if I was just a little bit positive, then I don't actually know. I'd have to go through and do the calculation again to see what the worst case scenario was. To see, right? So start with the worst case. Right, So here, when I do this, I put the larger number on the bottom because this is a positive term. I get um, a positive number. And the positive term here is still, even though I picked the worst case scenario for the positive number, it's still bigger than the negative number. So I get a positive answer. We'll do another example here with um, the heat transfer term. But this is often the tricky part, right? So we want to pick for that temperature. It has to be Calvin or Rankin. We want to pick a temperature that's outside of our control volume. And if possible, we want to pick the conservative version, right? So in this case, because that heat transfer term, when it was lumped together with the negative side, was positive, we wanted to make it as small as possible. If I just do this on the refrigerant side, Right? I make the same assumptions as I did if it was just the air side. Right? So it's still steady state. It's still one inlet, one outlet. This heat transfer term still sticks around. So I get the same equation. It's just that my out state is the refrigerant out, and my in state is the refrigerant in. Okay? But now I really got to think about that heat transfer term because it's not the given value. Because this given value was if my little stick figure, if my perspective was the air and I was losing heat. But now my little stick figure is inside the refrigerant. So now the refrigerant, it's not gaining heat. It's not losing heat like the air was. It's gaining heat. So the heat transfer term that I put in here is not negative 9.5 kilowatts. It's positive 9.5 kilowatts because the refrigerant is gaining heat. Right, so I have the option anyway to know the temperature. We'll talk about which one to select in this case. And I've already found S4 and S3, and I know the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. Right, so here I can just evaluate this just like I did when I did the total value. Right, again, I needed to know what the phase was to find S3 and S4. State 3 was under the vapor dome, so I needed to find quality. S4 was a superheated vapor, so I just looked it up on A4, and thankfully I didn't have to do double interpolation. Right? So I know that this term is now positive. Right? I wouldn't even have to do this next term if it was also positive, because the problem only asked me, is this thing possible? Unfortunately, because it's negative times the heat transfer rate, this term is going to be negative. Because now, instead of having a negative times a negative, like I did on the air side, I have a negative times a positive. So this is a negative term. So there's still going to be a tug of war between these two terms. And I got to see which value to pick. Right? So I put in 9.5 kilowatts. And again, I have two options to pick for my temperature. But this time, my Q dot term is negative. So I want to pick the denominator that makes my negative term as big as possible. Because again, I want the conservative answer. I want to make the this thing is not possible term as big as I can. Right. So in this case, I'm going to pick the lower value of the temperature. Because if I divide by a lower number, I'll have a bigger number. Right. And again, the difference between these two terms is not that big. So it probably functionally doesn't matter which term that I pick. 
right? But here, when I do the math, right, I do get a negative number, which is what I expect, but it is smaller than, so here, because the number is so small, maybe it would have mattered if I, I didn't actually do the calculation both ways. Maybe it would have mattered which temperature I picked. Right? But here I do see that my entropy generation rate is positive. Right? Um, in this case, it happens to be that if you add these two things together, you get the same answer as we did when we did the whole system. That's probably not always going to be true, and it's a little bit a function of the fact that we picked um, specific temperatures, right? So if I pick the other temperatures, it'd be off by a little bit, right? Um, but anyway, the entropy generation rate is positive. But a lot of times you'll expect these numbers to be kind of small, right? So um, if you get a number that's really big, it might mean that you made a math error. So that is the end of the first part of the lecture. Does anybody have any questions about how we fixed, fixed these states or found the values of specific entropy? Okay, we'll come back at 726. I'll see you in a bit. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> Today, or now, I guess, we're going to talk about something we call isentropic efficiency. So whenever we talk about an efficiency, it's going to be uh, a number between 0 and 1, or 0% and 100%, right? So remember that entropy is this property in a system, and it tells us something about disorder or randomness, right? And the second law tells us something about the direction of a process. Is it possible or impossible? We also talked about this idea of reversible processes, where reversible processes are ideal. Ideal processes don't exist, but they tell us the limit of what's possible. So it's kind of like this ideal that we're chasing, right? We can never get there, but we're trying to be close to it, right? Now, we also did this second law analysis for turbines and pumps, compressors too, where we would say often that they're steady state, that they're adiabatic, and then that they're, you know, so we would get, if we had that turbine that had, remember we, the first, first law example we did was a turbine that had one inlet and two outlets, right? So these summation signs could be important, right? But oftentimes there's no uh, one inlet and one outlet, right? Um, so if, if there was one inlet and one outlet, then this would just be a mass flow rate times delta S, right? But that would be equal to sigma dot. And if the process was ideal, sigma dot would be zero. We would not be generating, not destroying entropy, but not generating entropy. That's the limit of what's possible. So if you have a turbine or a pump, or a compressor, and it's steady state, adiabatic, one inlet and one outlet, and ideal, it will also have no change in the specific entropy. Right. Now, remember when we had something that was like no change in temperature, called that isothermal, if there was no change in volume, right? That was isometric. If there was no change in I can't remember another one right now. I'm blanking out, right? But what we call it, if there's no change in entropy, is we call it isentropic, right? So isen is kind of like iso, stays the same. Tropic is kind of implying entropy instead of, um, instead of something else like specific volume, right? If a process is real... Right? We said, oh, then that means that S2 is bigger than S1 in this case. Right? And we talked about drawing these on TS diagrams. This was when we introduced the idea of a TS diagram. Right? And we said, oh, this is nice because we can learn something about this. If we have a vertical line down for a turbine, well, that means it's isentropic. And for turbines, because they're steady state, ideal, 
are adiabatic, and you know if we see delta S is equal to zero, then we know it's ideal, right? But the real turbine, this line on the TS diagram is going to go down and to the right, you know, and the ideal pump is going to be a vertical line up, right? And the real pump is going to be up and to the right because the entropy has to increase. Right? So we said, oh, that's a good thing. We can draw what's going on on these TS diagrams. Right? Now, sometimes the nice thing about the ideal turbine right, is we're given enough information to fix the inlet state. Right? So two independent intensive properties. But if we know it's an ideal turbine, I only need one piece of information about the outlet. Because if it's ideal and a turbine, and so it's steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, then I know that ideal means isentropic. Right? So to fix state two, I know that S2, we call this S2S, we put the S in the subscript to denote or to tell ourselves, well, this is the isentropic version of the outlet. It's not actually possible, but that's the, uh, the best case scenario. So if I knew the pressure at the outlet and it was an ideal turbine, then I'd be able to fix the state at the exit, the ideal state, the best possible state. And I could then find, in this case, the quality, the way it's drawn here. And if I knew the quality, well, then I could tell you what the power was because I could then find H and put that into the first law. Ideal pumps, right? They're a little different because we have this special equation for ideal pumps. If I'm trying to find delta H, then the ideal pump, the delta H across an ideal pump is the specific volume times the change in pressure, right? So this is one of those things where when we ask, if we're trying to find specific enthalpy, the little h, right? I got to ask myself, what's the fluid? Okay, if it's water or refrigerant, right? Then I got to ask myself, not only now, is it a subcooled liquid or is it a two-phase mixture or is it a superheated vapor? I have to ask myself also, is it an ideal pump? Because if it's an ideal pump, then delta H is the specific volume times the change in pressure. What's delta S for an ideal pump? Well, it should be zero, right? Just like it should be, just like it was for the turbine, right? But we can check that out. Because one of the things we said in the last part of the lecture was that if you have specific volume to specific volume, then you can estimate the change in the specific entropy as it kind of looks like, if you squint, Cp times delta T, right? But this time it's Cp times the change in the natural logs, right? which is Cp times the natural log of T2 over T1. But what we said about the ideal pump when we first introduced this idea, before we knew about entropy, I said, well, in the ideal pump, the temperature changes zero. If the temperature changes zero, T2 is equal to T1, and the natural log of one is zero, right? So that's the answer that we get, right? So delta S across this ideal pump is zero, right? And that tells us that for this ideal pump, the temperature at the outlet is the same as the temperature at the inlet. It never actually happens because there's no such thing as an ideal pump, right? But if it was ideal, those temperatures would be exactly equal, right? So that's how we find the ideal state, right? But how do we deal with real turbines and real pumps? Can I use this information about the ideal case to figure out the real, right? So we know that for the real turbine, the outlet specific entropy is bigger than the inlet specific entropy, right? So the, the line here on the TS diagram goes down and to the right. And for the real pump, the line goes up and to the right. So we're going to introduce this thing that we call isentropic efficiency. Efficiency means I'm comparing two things. It also means that I'm going to get an answer that's basically a percentage goes from 0% to 1% to 100%, or it goes from 0 to 1, if you think of it as a per unit value, right? And the fact that it's isentropic, what that means is we're going to compare the real turbine 
to the ideal turbine, but the ideal turbine happens to be isentropic because of all the other assumptions that we made. And we can compare the real pump to an isentropic pump, but isentropic in this case also means ideal if we make all those other assumptions. Okay. So isentropic means that the entropy of the system does not change or it does not increase. Right? So it doesn't increase and it doesn't decrease. Right? It stays the same. This is a fancy word for ideal, provided that when we go through the second law analysis, it's a component that's steady state, that's one inlet, one outlet, and it's adiabatic. So we would never talk about an isentropic efficiency of a heat exchanger, because it doesn't really make sense to compare a heat exchanger to an isentropic version of a heat exchanger, because that isentropic version of the heat exchanger doesn't really mean anything because there's a Q dot term and there's a delta S term. It's not necessarily ideal. It could be impossible. It could be possible. It could be ideal, right? But for turbines, pumps, and compressors, which are like pumps that use air instead of liquid, um, right? If it's steady state, one inlet, one outlet, and adiabatic, and it's ideal, then it becomes isentropic. Right? So we only really talk about isentropic efficiencies when isentropic is synonymous for ideal. So we have this isentropic efficiency. And any time we talk about efficiencies, the symbol we use is this scripted N, which is the Greek letter eta. Right? So here the subscripts are T for turbine or P for pump. So what we use these isentropic efficiencies for is it's a way for us to compare the real version of that component with the ideal version of that component. So we want to see how well we're doing. That means, well, we'll see here, right? So the number always has to be less than 100%. Because, you know, here's a spoiler, you can't do better than the ideal version, right? So the job of the turbine is to produce power. So the ideal turbine is the turbine that produces the most power. You actually can't produce that much power, but that's the limit of the amount of power that you can produce, right? given your particular states. Right? So we're going to compare what the benefit of these different components are. And the benefit of the turbine is the power that it produces. Right. So how do I find an expression for the power of the turbine? I do a first law analysis. For turbines, I will often say that they're steady state, that there's no um, change in potential energy or kinetic energy, that they're adiabatic, so that heat transfer term goes away, and that they're one inlet and one outlet. Hopefully, we're starting to recognize or feel like this might be the equation if I'm trying to find power, right? That power is m dot times h in minus h out. And I let the first law tell me about the, the sign of my answer. For turbines, because turbines are power out or work out, I know that work in is negative from hip to win, so work out must be positive. So for a turbine, I'm expecting a positive value. So if I wanted to find an ideal turbine, my inlet state is state one. My outlet state is the ideal or isentropic value for state two. My real turbine is M dot times H in, which is state one and H out, which is state two. Now, when you're doing this, it only makes sense to compare real to ideal turbines if they have the same mass flow rate, right? Because the mass flow rates are different, you're going to get different values. But also that they have the same pressure drop because that means they're operating between the same two pressures. So those are the things that we want to hold constant when we're making this comparison. Same mass flow rate, same pressure difference. Now, which of these things is bigger. 
right? So we know that the ideal version of the component is always better. We also know that the job of the turbine is to produce power. So that means that the turbine power is a benefit. If you think about a power plant, it's that turbine power, that rotating shaft, that, um, that gets hooked up to the electrical generator. That's the job of the power plant is to produce that power. So the benefit should be higher, right? Which means that the ideal turbine is gonna do better and it's going to produce more power. So when we set up our isentropic efficiency, we're gonna take one of these things and divide by the other one. I always have to put the bigger one on the bottom, right? So my isentropic efficiency is going to be power over power. One of these is real and one of them is ideal. But because the turbine produces power and that produced power is a benefit, then we put the ideal turbine on the bottom and the real turbine on the top. This is not a thing you have to memorize because it's on the equation sheet. Right? But if you ever are logicking it out later on in life, then remember that the ideal one goes on the bottom for turbines because the turbine is producing power and that power is a benefit. So this is our isentropic efficiency for turbines. We're always going to get a value between 0 and 100% or between 0 and 1. We can do a similar thing with pumps, right? Where the first law analysis is exactly the same, right? We're again going to get that power is equal to m dot times h in minus h out. But now the pump, it only works if you plug it into the wall, right? And the reason for that is that when you plug it into a wall, there's a little motor. I mean, if you're plugging it into the wall, it's an electric motor, right? But maybe it's a gas powered pump and you're burning fuel to make a mechanical motor go, right? So you're putting work in. You're the one turning the shaft, right? So here, we think that this power is negative. So if you think about inside a power plant, we need to, you know, you ever, if you ever see like, uh, you ever watch The Simpsons, right? They got those big stacks that are um, outside the nuclear power plant and what that stack is doing is condensing steam into liquid, right? So it's this big thing and you put the steam in the bottom, but as the steam goes up, right, eventually it condenses and it falls back down as liquid water and you pull it out the bottom. And then it goes into a pump that increases the pressure, but that takes power in. So the power plant is the first consumer of the power that the power makes, that the power plant makes, right? This is like, it's also true in automobiles, so in an automobile, you have a starter motor. Or have you ever seen like old movies where they're driving around like Model T Fords? The guy got like a crank and got to start the engine manually, putting in, you know, muscle power, human power to start the engine. But then once it starts running, then it can power itself, right? So here, the pump power is a cost to the system, All right? But still, we've got an ideal power in a real power. Which one's bigger, right? So in this case, because the power is a cost to the system, the bigger value is the real pump. The ideal pump consumes less power. So there's less cost to run the ideal pump, right? Because if you think about it, it you know, if, let's think about the friction in the system, in the bearings. A real bearing has friction, right? So when you're putting power in to get the same pressure difference, not only do you have to increase the pressure of the liquid, you also have to overcome the friction that's in those bearings, right? So you have to put more power in to get the same pressure difference in the system that has friction. So our isentropic efficiency, it's the same idea as the isentropic efficiency for the turbine. It's still power over power we still need an answer that's less than 100%. I still wanna put the bigger value on the bottom, 
But in this case, the bigger value is the real value because this is power being consumed. It's a negative number, right? So the real pump consumes more power than the ideal pump. So here I have ideal power divided by real power. So the real power is the denominator. And that's the difference, right? But again, you don't have to memorize these things because they're on the equation sheet, right? And plus you get to make your own equation sheet because it's an open book exam, right? But if you're thinking about it, if you ever think about it, you don't have it written down, you don't want to tear through the textbook or the notes and try to find the answer. Um, it's the bigger one that goes on the bottom. And if the energy, if the, if the energy we're talking about is a benefit, like turbine power, then it's the ideal case that goes on the bottom. But if the energy is a cost, like in a pump or a compressor, then it's the real value that goes on the bottom. Right? So oftentimes, I'll fix the states by understanding the idea that, um, that it's, the ideal one is isentropic. So I'll use the fact that, that I know delta S is zero across the ideal version, Right? And then I only need one piece of information about the outlet. Right? But if I want the real one, I'll need some other piece of information. And that piece of information could be the isentropic efficiency. Right? So I know that in the real case, S increases across a turbine and S increases across a pump. Right? So because there's these inefficiencies, the friction... In, so friction robs you of some of the power that you would have otherwise produced in an ideal turbine. And friction makes it to get the same pressure difference across a liquid, you have to put even more power into a pump because you have to overcome whatever friction is in the system or whatever irreversibilities are in that system. Right. So it decreases the benefit and it increases the cost. It's kind of like a bank, right? We talked about how the second law of the universe is a bit like a bank where it takes a cut of every energy transaction, right? Uh, right? So it, here it's like it's taking a little bit less out of what you're making, right? Putting a little bit more into what you're uh, producing. Makes you put a little more into what you're producing, right? So there's two kind of ways that I can ask you a problem that has to do with isentropic efficiency. In the first case, it can be like this, right? So here's an example of a turbine problem. And it asks me, what's the isentropic efficiency of the turbine, right? So I can ask you a problem where I'm saying, compute for me the isentropic efficiency, where that's the required information and not given information. If that's the case, I have to give you enough information to calculate the inlet state and the outlet state, right? So here I need to fix the states, right? So in the first state, I know the temperature and the pressure. It's a pump. So I, uh, no, this was a turbine, right? So I'm expecting going into the turbine that I'm either going to have um, saturated vapor, superheated vapor, or, you know, maybe a very high quality, right? Because if I have um, a quality that's like 98%, what that means is that there's still a little bit of liquid in there. It's like little tiny liquid droplets, right? But the turbine has got these beautifully machined um, blades, like fan blades, right? And if I have little tiny water droplets in there and those fan blades are whipping around, those water droplets are impinging on those blades, hitting those blades over and over and over again, right? Which is um, not great for the surface, right? So I would prefer to have steam going into my turbine than like, like superheated vapor than high quality steam that's mostly steam but still has water droplets in it, right? So I'm expecting this to be a superheated vapor or a saturated vapor, right? Um, so I'm going to look, especially because they told me temperature and pressure, so I can't fix the state if it's, uh, if it's under the vapor dome, right? So here I would look on table A4, and I would find H and S, 
right? So I go to A4. I look for the, it's a table of tables based by pressure. I look for 10 bars, and then one of those rows is going to be 600 degrees, right? So I get H and S. Hopefully, that's something where we feel comfortable with. Now, how do I find the ideal exit, right? So first, in this case, I know that the temperature is different. But also, this is state 2S. It's the isentropic outlet of the turbine. And if it's isentropic, that means that the entropy doesn't change. So it looks like on this table that I only know one thing about state 2, but this is like that closed, rigid container where I knew in state two, the volume had to be the same because the container was rigid, right? Here, I know the specific entropy has to be the same because it's an isentropic process, right? So how do I find H2? I use the fact that I know S2, right? So now I got to look at 45 degrees and figure out where I am. What's the phase? Coming out of a turbine, I'm probably expecting this to be towards the right of the vapor dome or in the superheated vapor region. So the first thing that I would check here is I would go to the 45 degree line on table A2 and check to see if S, if this value of S is in between SF and SG. And that's often going to be the case coming out of a turbine, right? But it could still be superheated vapor. It's not going to be liquid, right? Um, right? So in this case, we were in between those two values, right? So here, I know S2. If I go to my two-phase table on the row for 45 degrees, I can get SF and SG. Really, I'm going to have to manually calculate this as SG minus SF if I'm using the textbook tables. But then I can use this equation to find x2. Again, this is like that closed rigid container case where I knew the volume stayed the same, but maybe the temperature or the pressure changed, and I can use that information to find the quality. Right? Once I know the quality, now I'm in business because I can use that same quality equation to find the specific enthalpy. Right? It's the same shape of the equation, but I change all the S's for H's, right? I look up, see, so now it's different. If I just started with this equation for the specific enthalpy, I'd be in trouble because I wouldn't know H and I wouldn't know X, right? Um, and then I, I, one equation and two unknowns, like you don't have to be a mathematician to know that that's not a great place to be, right? So I needed this other equation. I needed this information that it was isentropic because that let me find x2s once i found x2s now i can find h2s because i know h2s now i could find the power developed by the isentropic turbine right which is half the battle when we're talking about the isentropic efficiency right the other half of the battle is that i need to find the real turbine power Right, so now I got to find what's going on with this outlet from the real turbine. Right here, this is well, we can right because the ideal turbine came out as mostly steam, a little bit of liquid. This real turbine comes out with the quality as one, but the temperature is the same, which means the pressure is the same too. Right, but I've jogged over to the right a little bit. Because now I'm not actually under the vapor dome. I'm right on that red line when I go to state three, right? So the entropy here is higher. So I'm expecting the entropy here to be bigger than this 8.029. But let's see, right? I can just look this up on the table because they told me the quality is one. So I can go right to the two phase tables. I go to A2 because it's water and I know the temperature. I find a 45 degree line. And S2 is just equal to SG, right? This is good because it's bigger than S1, which is bigger than S2S, right? Which means that I didn't break the second law, which is good because that would mean the process is impossible, right? And I don't even have to do any interpolation 
because H2 is HG. Right? So I just write that down. Notice that H is bigger here. Right? So we'll see if I'm expecting the real turbine to produce less power than the ideal turbine. Right? So this big number minus this smallest number, that's a bigger delta than if I take this minus this. So that fits my expected reality. I look on my equation sheet. I see that turbine efficiency is the real turbine divided by the ideal turbine, right? I never really have to put the mass flow rates in here because it only makes sense to talk about isentropic efficiencies when it's the same mass flow rate and the same pressure difference. So the mass flow rates are just going to cancel out. I know all the H values. I don't know the mass flow rates, but I actually don't care what they are because they cancel out. M dot over M dot is just one, right? It's my second favorite math, right? The best math is when the answer is zero. The next best math is when the answer is one, right? So here I can see that my turbine efficiency is pretty good here, right? I haven't hit the limit of what's possible, but I'm pretty close, right? 96%, pretty close to the ideal case but not quite there, right? This kind of makes sense to me. So that's one way that we can answer a question, right? Or I can pose a question to you about isentropic efficiencies is that I can tell you what the states are and ask you what the efficiency is. The other thing I can do is I can tell you what the isentropic efficiency is and ask you what the real outlet is. Right? And that's what I'm doing in this pump question. So here, we say find H4, or the outlet state for the pump, if the pump efficiency is 90%. Pumps are actually easier if I remember this idea about pumps, that the specific enthalpy, the change in specific enthalpy is V times delta P. Right? So I'm going to look up here I know that it's liquid going in. I know the temperature, so I'm just going to take HF at 45 degrees. So I'm going to do that HF, and this is going to be SF, because it's a subcooled liquid, right? That's what we do for subcooled liquids. How do I find the ideal term or the ideal pump outlet? Well, I know delta S is equal to zero, right? But I don't have to look this up on a table, right? Because I know delta H across an ideal pump, which is what we, do, what we have when we move from 3 to 4S, is the specific volume times the change in pressure. So the specific volume, which is almost always for water, 1 over 1,000 meters cubed per kilogram, if we're talking about the metric system. I know my pressure differences. I like to have my pressures in kilopascals when I'm doing this calculation. Because then kilopascals is kilonewtons per meter squared. Kilonewton meters is kilojoules. So I'll get my delta H in the same terms as H when I look it up in the textbook. Right? As always, the units would be a little trickier. It's the same equation if it's imperial. But the units are a little trickier because the volume, the specific volume is probably cubic feet per pound mass. And the change in pressure is probably pounds per square inch. So you have to do a little bit better unit conversion. Right? So here I know it's exactly one higher, or approximately one higher. So I just add one over here. I wouldn't necessarily have to do this, because I actually, the problem doesn't ask me what 4S is, what H4S is, right? But I put it in my table anyway. Right? Now, it tells me that I'm trying to find the ideal outlet or the real outlet when the efficiency is 0.9. Same thing, I know the pump outlet. It only makes sense if the mass flow rates are the same. If the mass flow rates are the same, you can't really compare the pumps because the power scales with the mass flow rate, right? It's linear with the mass flow rate. So the M dots cancel out. Now, I got to rearrange the equation a little bit, right? Because I'm trying to find something in the denominator here. So I'm going to multiply up here and bring the efficiency down. 
right? And then I'll rearrange this a little bit, or I guess I can take inventory, right? So I know everything on the right-hand side, right? So I know that H3 minus H4 is minus 1.1 kilojoules per kilogram, or that H4 is 1.1 kilojoules per kilogram higher than H3, which again is a little bit higher than it was in the ideal case, right? So for the ideal case, delta H, the power that we put in, m dot times delta H, delta H here is smaller in the ideal case and a little bit bigger in the real case. So that's basically the two things, the two ways we can ask isentropic efficiency kind of problems. I can give you the efficiency and the inlet case and ask you inlet state and ask you to find the outlet state. Or I can give you the inlet and the outlet state and ask you to find the efficiency. That kind of makes sense? So that's where we'll leave it. We'll come back at uh, 8.05 and we'll start to talk about uh, Rankin cycles, which are um, sort of steam power plants. So power plants that uh, burn coal or use nuclear reactions. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so we've been talking about open systems, right? We know that for open systems, we need to figure out what the boundaries of the system is. We need to know what happens to the mass because mass brings energy with it. Then we can do conservation of energy. And if we need to, we can say, will this system operate in real life, right? Does the system, does the pro excuse me, does the process generate entropy? Generally, these questions will give us symbolic solutions that are a function of H or S or maybe specific volume if we're talking about conservation of mass. And then we ask ourselves, what's the fluid? And when I know what the fluid is, then I can fix the states. Conservation of mass looks like this, right? Although M dot can be specific volume or it can be area times velocity over specific volume. Oftentimes, we'll say that it, the system is at steady state with one inlet and one outlet, which means that the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. Conservation of energy for open systems looks like this. If it's got imperial units, then this kinetic and potential energy term has GC in the denominator. And the units are going to be a pain, but even if it's a metric problem, if the kinetic or potential energies stick around, it's going to be a pain with the units, right? Assumptions we might make. So here we really got to get comfortable with the different kinds of blocks, the different kinds of devices that we use. What are the, uh, what's the general energy transaction that happens in those different components? And what are the assumptions that we tend to make for those different components? Right? There's some list of common assumptions that are down here. For the second law, we have a similar equation. We're trying to figure out what's going on with sigma dot. Is it positive, negative, or equal to zero? Because those things have physical meanings. In this class, we're always going to say that all these things are at steady state. They may have one inlet and one outlet, and or they may be adiabatic. The Q dot term here has the same sign, follows that hip to wind sign convention that we have. The temperature though, has to be a temperature that's not inside my system. And it has to be an absolute temperature, right? So either Rankin or Kelvin. Now I'm gonna say, what's the fluid, right? So if it's water, I ask myself, is it a subcooled liquid? If it is a subcooled liquid, is it going between two subcooled liquids? Am I going across an ideal pump? Is it a two-phase mixture where I can say, um, oh, what's the quality between zero and one, right? Or is it a superheated vapor? Then I got to look it up in the textbook on table A5. Got to look at that table of tables. If it's an ideal gas, then I got to ask myself, oh, 
Is it a constant specific heat problem or is it a variable specific heat problem? Right? Constant specific heat means I'm never going to find delta H or I'm never going to find the individual H's or the individual U's, right? It's going to be specific heat times delta T, right? And I got different equations for delta S too. If it's variable specific heat, I got to get a bunch of numbers off um, table A22 like U or H where that S superscript zero, which is not the same thing as S. So delta S superscript zero is only part of the specific entropy change. If it's an ideal gas, I still need the pressure component, right? So if I'm looking for uh, H or delta H, I want to use tables if it's water, right? Or refrigerants. If it's a subcooled liquid, maybe I can say that delta H is CP times delta T. If it's an ideal pump, it's going to be the specific volume times delta P is equal to delta H. Watch your units in that calculation. If it's an ideal gas, either it's going to be delta H, and I'll look up those values of H on A22, knowing something like the temperature, or it's going to be specific heat at constant pressure, or Cp, times delta T. If it's delta S, Again, if it's a two-phase, if it's water or something like it, I'm going to use uh, the tables, right? For ideal pumps or turbines, I know that delta S is zero, that they're isentropic if it's ideal. For subcooled liquids, I can approximate delta S as Cp times the natural log of T2 over T1, which is the same as Cp times natural log of T2 minus natural log of T1. And then for ideal gases, I have different equations. If it's variable specific heat and I'm using table A22, I approximate this uh, delta S because of the temperature with these superscript zero values. Right? And if it's, um, if it's not, then I use um, these values which have CP or CV in it. It's a hint that if I ask you to use constant specific heat and it's an ideal gas, you need to find the equations that have Cp, Cv, or um, we haven't talked about this too much, but K, K is equal to Cp divided by Cv. Right? For air, it's 1.4 usually. Right? If I'm using variable specific heat or the equation with S superscript zero in it, then my accuracy is higher than if I'm not. So we talked about isentropic processes if uh, the working fluid is water, but there's some other equations we can use if the working fluid is an ideal gas, right? So uh, if it was delta H and it was an ideal gas, we would say that Cp delta T is equal to delta H, right? But how do we find the change in temperature if it's an isentropic process, right? So if we're going through a gas turbine where the working fluid we approximate is air or an air compressor which is like a pump but instead of liquid coming in and out where we're changing the pressure it's gases coming in and out um, where we're increasing the pressure right so when delta h is zero and we're using constant specific heat constant specific heat means we're using equations that have cp or cv in it Sometimes those equations have K in it, where K is the specific heat ratio, which is Cp over Cv, which is approximately 1.4 for air, although it changes a little bit depending on the temperature. Just like the delta S equations, sometimes I'll know the temperatures and the pressures. Sometimes I'll know the temperatures and the specific volumes. So if I know the temperatures and the pressures, usually for open systems, I'll use this equation. If I know the temperatures and the specific volumes, then I'll use this equation. The textbook in the equation sheet also have this equation. I don't think I've ever used this equation you know, while going through this class, uh, but it's there if you want it. So you could put this equation into one of these equations to get the other one, to get the other equation. Um, so it's there. All, all three of these equations could be derived, although I wouldn't recommend doing it on a test. They come from these equations, which we call B and C in the other uh, lecture. 
right? They just set delta S equal to zero and they use these relationships. And they also use this relationship that R, remember that's the specific gas constant, happens to be equal to CP minus CV. But you never have to do that derivation. You just need to know that if it's a constant specific heat problem and it's isentropic, then you can use these equations. Typically this one, if it's an open system, you're going to know temperatures and pressures. This one, if it's a closed system, where you'll often know temperatures and specific volumes. So here's an example of an isentropic compressor. So compressors are like pumps. Their job is to increase the pressure, but now of an ideal gas and not a liquid. So going into our compressor, we have air at 300 degrees Kelvin. It's a pretty close to room temperature here. And at atmospheric pressure, or at least pretty close to atmospheric pressure, one bar or 100 kilopascals. And we're increasing the pressure to 800 kilopascals. This is something that I still need to do at home. I, uh, so I, I like to use the sauna in the RIT, um, you know, at the gym here at RIT. I think sauna is really good for you. Uh, it's great, it's relaxing, it's good for your heart. Um, and I was doing it every day for maybe like three years, basically every day I was at work until the pandemic, because in the pandemic they closed the gym, right? Um, so I built a sauna at home, um, you know, but I had a little bit of cedar left over. And I think I was telling you the other day that my uh, my air conditioner, there was a little problem with my air conditioner and a bunch of the condensate sort of, uh, you know, made a big pool of water, uh, you know, and, and so it bled over to where we have our guest bathroom, bedroom. And it kind of, I was just using an old box as like a bedside table, cardboard box, not so good if it got wet. So I used a bunch of the extra wood that I had from my, uh, from when I built my sauna to make a, a bedside table. Right? It's not like super nice, but it works, right? So I, I got to nail some stuff together, right? So I got to, you know, maybe when I get home or maybe on the weekend or something, fire up my air compressor and just the nail gun, right? So I'm going to be doing this relatively soon, right? And here we're asked to find the power consumed by the compressor per mass flow rate flowing through the compressor, right? So if we did the first law analysis, we would assume that this was steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, and we would neglect kinetic and potential energy changes, right? So we would find that W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out. Now, maybe I don't have enough information here to find the outlet, right? Because I only have the pressure. If I say that this is an ideal or isentropic compressor, then delta S is equal to zero, right? So if it's constant specific heat, I can approximate delta H as CP times delta T. So my power for the compressor becomes M dot CP times T in minus T out. I was told T in, right? But I don't know T out. But if it's an ideal piece of equipment, I'll know the pressure and I'll know the specific entropy, or at least I know that the change in specific entropy is zero. That means I can use an isentropic relationship for ideal gases, right? So in this case, I'm trying to find T out. I pick this isentropic relationship because I know the temperatures and I know the pressures. Now, this is not going to tell me the real outlet temperature. It's going to tell me some idealized version of that temperature, right? What that temperature would be if it was an ideal compressor. I know P2 is 800 kilopascals or 8 bar. P1 is 1 bar, right? So this, and it's kind of interesting, right? The nice thing, because I have a ratio of pressures here, doesn't matter if it's in kilopascals or bar or megapascals, um, it's going to be the same number because it's just a ratio as long as they're in the same units, right? K, I would look it up, but for air, it's usually about 1.4. I need to put the temperatures in Kelvin or Rankine because they're not temperature differences, 
right? I get a very different answer if T1 is zero or if it's 273. Right? I put that into my equation and I can get an answer for T2S. Right? So I can get some approximation of what the ideal outlet temperature would be. So it's still a very, right? And then because I knew this, if I knew the real temperature, I could tell you the isentropic efficiency. Or if I gave you the isentropic efficiency, you could tell me the real temperature, right? So for ideal gases, trying to find this temperature at the outlet, if it's isentropic, if it's constant specific heat, this is the method that we use. Now I know this outlet temperature, and because I now I just it's a matter of putting stuff into my computer or into my uh, calculator, which is computing things. So I'm not totally wrong, right? And this will give me the power per unit mass flowing through the system. 243 kilojoules per kilogram. But this is if it's constant specific heat, right? So I because it's constant specific heat, I get to use equations that have CP, CV, and K in them. Or K, I guess. Right? Makes sense here because the um, we get a negative value for power and the compressor is like a pump it's consuming power what do we do if it's variable specific heat here there's other equations so if you look on the equation sheet i i made the equation sheet so i think it's laid out logically um but it's got different headers and one of the headers is isentropic relationships for ideal gases right or isentropic ideal gas equations in here you'll see that if it's an ideal gas and it's isentropic and it's variable specific heat because these equations don't have cp cv or k in them then the ratio of pressures is equal to this ratio of prs right that's the reduced pressures those pr values so usually for open systems we'll use the pressure ratios and for closed systems we'll usually use the volume ratio <clears throat> the cool thing about this is if you go to table A22, right? Before today, what we knew is if I know the temperature, then I can find H and I can find U. Today we talked about using S superscript zero. But then there's this PR and VR value. And the cool thing about table A22 is that usually to fix a state, I need two independent intensive problems. But for ideal gases, because ideal gases have this pressure volume relationship, right, the ideal gas law, I can fix the state with one property provided that it's one of the properties on this table. So here, if I knew the pressure ratio across the ideal compressor and I had enough information to find PR1, then I could find PR2. And if I knew PR2, if it was 1.386, then I know that I could just go backwards across this table and figure out whatever other properties I want to know, like H, for example. So in this case, in state one, we were told that the temperature was 300 degrees. So that means I can work my way across here and I can see that H1 is 300.19 and PR1, because remember, we know the temperatures and the pressures here, so we're going to use this pressure relationship. PR1 is 1.386. So I know PR1. P2, so the real outlet pressure has to be the same as the ideal outlet pressure because it only makes sense to compare the real and ideal turbine or pump or compressor if they have the same mass flow rate and they have the same pressure difference. So the pressure P2 is still 8 bar or 800 kilopascals. P1 is still 1 bar or 100 kilopascals, right? So I can take 1.386 and multiply by 8 
and I get 11.09. So I know it's not on this part of the table. I got to keep looking on this table until I find 11.09. That's pretty close to 11.1, right? So now the thing that I know is 11.1, that puts me on this row of the table. And if I want to find H2, it's going to be 544.35. So before today, when we were using A22, we really only knew how to do a case like state one, where we knew the temperature and we interpolated from left to right on table A22. But now, for these isentropic ideal gas processes, what will happen is we'll often, for the outlet case, know a pressure ratio if it's an open system or a volume ratio if it's a closed system. And that will let us find PR at the outlet. We'll hunt through. Maybe we'll have to interpolate, find some interpolation factor. Like if this was 10.9, then I'd have to find some interpolation factor between 10.37 and 10 and 11.1, .1, right? And then I could do that same interpolation factor and find H, right? So if we wanted to do this same problem as a variable specific heat problem, then we do this interpolation using table A22 because it's variable specific heat, I can't use CP times delta T I actually have to find H1 and H2. So I use those two values. I see that H1 is smaller than H2, which is makes sense, because H1 minus H2 should be negative. And here I get minus 244.16 kilojoules per kilogram. My compressor is consuming power, which is why when I'm uh, finishing my table here, um, I'm going to have to plug my compressor into the wall. Does that part kind of make sense? So it's a little trickier um, when we're trying to use these isentropic relationships for ideal gas problems. Um, but there are two ways to do it, right? So one is using the isentropic relationships that have K in the exponent. That's if it's constant specific heat or to use these PR and VR values on table A22, right? So you can always come back to these notes and check out how we did this particular example if that's something that you need to do, right? Again, the work is negative and we get almost the same answer that we did um, in the last case. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about Rankine cycles, right? So Rankine cycles, and it, you know, the good news here is that we already kind of got a sneak peek at this, right? Because I talked about before when we were talking about um, ideal power cycles, we did this kind of basic four component Rankine cycle, right? So this is uh, the most basic kind of coal power plant or nuclear power plant that you can have. And it's got four different open system components in it. A turbine which is like the whole reason that we run this particular process. We take high temperature, high pressure steam, run it over some fan blades to make a shaft turn, and then we get low pressure, low temperature steam. We want to condense that to liquid, increase the pressure through a pump, and then we have high pressure liquid, but we want high pressure steam to go into the turbine, so then we got to boil it, right? And we boil it typically by burning coal or by running some kind of nuclear reaction, right? So why do you care? Why are these Rankine cycles important, right? Um, and it's because Rankine cycles are still an important way for us to get electricity, right? So we couldn't have a Zoom class without power, right? Now, this data is from 2019, so maybe I could update it again. As I've been teaching this class, Rankine cycles, so cycles that um, power that we get from mostly from coal and nuclear has been decreasing since I started teaching this class. But it's still almost half the power we produce in the US. At least it was in 2019. I imagine 
that these numbers have continued to fall in the three years since that well two and a half years since this uh, data became available um right so Rankin cycles the most important Rankin cycles for us are coal power plants and nuclear power plants right there's also some ways um, some green power systems that could use um, that could use heat to boil some kind of fluid um, but typically um, well solar is the big thing on here right um, but typically solar is now photovoltaic and not this kind of boiling with solar but you could do it right this is the thing um, at least historically if you're a mechanical engineer and somebody gives you heat you're like how can I boil water with it right because that's like a steam locomotive but it's also a nuclear power plant right nuclear power plant is just a different way to generate heat so how does a coal power plant work right we classify these power plants by the thing we use to get heat right so in a coal power plant I'm sure this is not a surprise to you the thing that we use to get heat is coal so we burn that coal it's just like that old steam locomotive right it's you know maybe there's not you know a person shoveling coal into the boiler right but that's what this thing is doing right so there are different sort of systems here right so um water is the working fluid this is kind of the workhorse of the system right a pump a boiler a turbine and a condenser right that's what we're interested in in this class right it's water that's running through the pipes in that part of the system right but the first energy transaction that we're doing is returning that chemical energy that's stored in coal right so the carbon bonds that are in that coal we're breaking them up to generate heat right so we're burning that right we're producing co2 which is obviously one of the downsides of coal power plants right? getting coal is also not a great process right we're um using that heat to boil water that's what happens in here that gives us high temperature high pressure steam which we expand through a turbine to get power that turbine creates a spinning shaft and that's great if you're like you know i don't know if you've ever seen when i was uh i grew up in hamilton which was like a a steel town kind of like the pittsburgh of canada um and we used to go to this nice fancy restaurant it was called the old mill it was this beautiful stone building and it used to be a mill a sawmill right and the reason they put a sawmill there was because there was a river that went by and there was a big paddle wheel and they put that paddle wheel in the river so that when the river was flowing it turned the paddle wheel so they had that um shaft that was spinning and then you could make like a four bar linkage so you could make a saw go back and forth and you could cut wood right and that's great but it's all mechanical right it doesn't help me turn the lights on or have this zoom class right so we need to be friends with electrical engineers because an electrical engineer can turn this spinning shaft into alternating current right or maybe direct current too right but this is power that we put out onto the electricity grid right now in the condenser over here we say oh yeah the water cools down so we can pump it up right but how does it cool down one of the ways that it cools down is this water tower we talked about this on the simpsons right so there's water coming in through here and that water gets heated up as it moves through this condenser because this water is cooling down right you spray it out in this cooling tower and maybe it's steam but maybe it's liquid if it's liquid it just falls if it's steam it rises in this cooling tower but as it rises it cools off and then it falls back down as liquid and we pull it out and we just keep running this thing over and over and over again now um here in rochester or when i was on the canadian side of lake ontario um i did some consulting for a nuclear power plant that uh well really i was consulting for the consulting company that was consulting for the people who ran the nuclear power plant because that's how these things work right um and we were thinking about the cooling system there right and what they did right which is pretty common is we're blessed with these enormous lakes right so what we did is yeah i don't know you ever go swimming in lake ontario if you go down deep enough any really big body of water you go down deep enough eventually you'll get to this like 
very like dramatic temperature drop, right? Because eventually the sun can't penetrate deep enough into the lake. So it's not getting heated by the sun anymore. So it's like this cold layer underneath there. And if you go deep enough into the lake, you'll get to water that's about four degrees Celsius, which is water at its most dense, which is when it has its best cooling capacity. So in the lake, they would pull water out of the lake below that sort of thermal line, right? And they'd use it to cool the nuclear power plant and then put it back in the lake, right? Now, there's environmental regulations that say you can't put it back into the lake, um, you know, over a certain temperature relative to the temperature of the water in the lake, right? So there's the regulations. But here we're showing this cooling system as a cooling tower. But if you're like us and you're blessed with the natural resources um, to just have this massive natural heat sink, then you might use that too. So there's different things we can be dumping this heat into. Right? But for us, what we're really interested in is the Rankine cycle itself in this class. We actually don't care where the heat's coming from. We don't care about the electrical generator. We don't really care where the heat's going to, although sometimes we might think about the cooling water that's coming in or going out, right? We're thinking about this, you know, these fluid elements that's just going around and around and around in what we call this thermodynamic cycle. It's the same water that's going around and around and around. It's boiling, it's going through a turbine, it's condensing, it's going through a pump, and it just keeps going around and around and around, right? So what this is, is it's a big energy transaction machine, right? First, we turn this chemical energy into heat, right? And then we turn that heat into steam, right? Or we use that heat to make steam, right? And we use that steam to get mechanical power out of our turbine. Right? And then we turn that mechanical power into electrical power. Right? So there's all this energy cascade that's happening. Right? Now, the problem is that there's so many of these energy transactions, and we know the universe is just sitting there for every one of those transactions taking a cut. Right? So that means we never get out as much energy as we put in. Right? It's impossible. Right? Um, the way that we talk about these plants is we name them by the way that we get heat. Right? So a coal power plant is one that gets heat by burning coal. A nuclear power plant, and I remember being, I wouldn't say devastated, but certainly disappointed when I figured this out or when I was told this, is that, you know, because like, like a nuclear power plant, it's like Star Trek level stuff, right? It's like the, this pinnacle of human achievement. And there's a mechanical engineer sitting in the back of the room that says, well, this nuclear reaction really gives off a lot of heat. I bet I could use it to boil water, right? So that's what we do in a nuclear power plant, right? It's the most sophisticated steam engine that we could possibly make, at least that we know about so far, right? So we use this um, beautiful physical process, right, to boil water, right? And the water runs through here, right? It's the same thing, right? We make steam because we like steam. We can put it over fan blades and get mechanical energy, right, which we then turn into electrical energy. You can do this using solar. So here you're probably not using water because it takes a lot of energy to boil water. Maybe something like a refrigerant. You can have solar collectors, right? So think about like a, a polished, you know, half cylinder and it's reflecting all the sun's energy onto this tube full of refrigerant that boils the refrigerant, right? That generates some heat, right? We use that to boil some other refrigerant over here, runs through a turbine, right? It's a rankin cycle. Right? You can use geothermal energy to do this too, right? So we're not as blessed with this particular resource, right? But in some of the Scandinavian countries, then, um, you know, they have these um, hot streams, right? These, this geothermal heat that's coming from the earth, right? Geo is earth, right? Thermal is heat, right? There's just heat that's being created under here, right? So we're like, well, let's just take some of that heat. It's already there. Might as well boil water with it, right? So we can make a Rankin cycle that's based on geothermal power, right? It's all Rankin cycles as long as we're using the heat to boil water that we're running through a turbine, right? It's all um, 
Rankin cycles. That's what a Rankin cycle is. Right? And the simplest version, the most basic version of a Rankin cycle, right? And just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy, right? It just means this is the least complicated version. But even the least complicated version still has four different components to it, right? It's got a pump. Well, in order, a turbine, that's the workhorse. This is the thing that's doing... The, if, if we could just have the turbine in the system, we would do that, right? So the turbine is producing power, and the rest of these things are just getting the water back to high temperature, high pressure steam so we can run it through the turbine again. Right? And when we're classifying these different Rankin cycles, the way we do it is we talk about where we're getting the heat from. And that can be a little bit confusing because you'll see when we start to talk about natural gas power plants, there we're also talking about where we're getting the heat from, but in a natural gas power plant, we're not using the heat to boil water. Right? But we'll get there. We're not there yet. But this is a heat engine, just like we talked about it before, right? So the way we can characterize how well our heat engine works is we can take the energy benefit, which in this case is the power, the net power, right? So the turbine power that's produced. But remember, the power plant is the first consumer of the power plant, right? So some of this turbine power gets diverted to run this pump. Right? So the net power, how much net power do we get for every unit of heat that we put in? Right? So because this is a heat engine, the way we characterize it is with thermal efficiency. Thermal efficiency is net power, which is the energy benefit of a heat engine, divided by heat rate in, which is the cost of the, um, of the, of the heat engine. Right? So here... If we improved efficiency, there's two ways we could do this. Is we could keep burning the same amount of coal but get more power. Right? Or we could be getting more power relative to the heat that we go in. So we could get, you know, I guess it's kind of the same thing. But you can think about it in, in two different ways, right? So you can either have the power increase faster than the increased heat, or you can have the heat decrease faster than the decrease in power, right? But that's our thermal efficiency, right? And we know that Calvin and Planck told us that we can never get to one. And actually, it feels a little bit depressing when you do this for mechanical engines because uh, cause we usually can't... If you compare thermal efficiency to the type of grade you'd like to get on a test, um, you'll be disappointed with thermal efficiency. Because, you know, if you can get to 65... That's a good uh, that's a good thermal efficiency, right? But I'm sure we're all shooting for better than that on the midterm, right? So in the simplest case, we've got these four different components, right? So we can do a first law analysis on all four of these different components, and we already have, right? But we did it in an ideal case, and I showed you that actually, if it's an ideal case, you don't have to do all this. All you need to know are the hot temperatures and the cold temperatures. And you can use the Carnot efficiency equation, right? So the boiler, its job is to boil water. So the most important term here is the heat transfer term. The turbine, its job is to produce power. So the most important term is the power generation term. The condenser is removing heat from the water. So it, we're trying to find the Q dot term. Although here you'll notice this component, there's four components here, but there's only three of them that contribute to um, our thermal efficiency. The, um, the condenser, it doesn't actually contribute, right? Because it's just net power, so the turbine power plus the pump power, which is negative, divided by the heat rate in. The heat rate out doesn't show up in the thermal efficiency. The pump, that's where we're putting power in, so the power term is important there. Don't cross it out. And then we get back to the boiler, right? So it just keeps going around and around and around, right? So if I was going to draw a TS diagram, right? Now, remember, the one that I did before was a little bit artificial because I only had wanted to have one hot temperature and one cold temperature, so it was all under the vapor dome. But you don't want to design your power plants like that 
because you don't want vapor in your pumps and you don't want liquid in your turbine right so you want to be outside of the vapor dome when you have your turbine and your pump so a ts diagram for this four component system looks like this if you're drawing a ts diagram for these things the important thing to know or one of the most important things to know is how many pressures are in the system to find the number of pressures you take you add up the number of turbines and the number of pumps and you take the maximum which one's bigger so you add you, is, how many turbines are there oh there's one how many pumps are there oh there's one so you take the maximum number and you add one to it right so in this case the simple case where there's only four components then you only have two pressures an inlet pressure for the pump and an outlet pressure for the pump but the outlet pressure for the pump is the same as the inlet pressure for the turbine and the outlet pressure for the turbine is the same as the inlet pressure for the pump so there's a high pressure and a low pressure here you can see the assumption that we make when we have heat transfer is we assume the pressure remains approximately constant in real life the pressure would drop but it doesn't drop by that much not compared to how much power we're putting out in the turbine right same for the condenser we assume that this heat transfer process happens at constant pressure the pump increases the pressure and the turbine decreases the pressure because the pump is putting work in to store enthalpy in the fluid it does that by increasing the pressure the turbine harvests enthalpy from the fluid to get mechanical power right and one of the ways it does that is by dropping the pressure so if we want to find the thermal efficiency here we need to know the net power and we need to know the heat rate in so when i draw these ts diagrams i like to show what's going on in each process so here i signify that the turbine is creating power because my arrow is coming out of the cycle right the cycle is like the area that's inside this ts diagram here my arrowhead is coming out of the cycle so that's work out i know work in is negative so work out must be positive work is going in on the pump side right so if i want to find the net work the textbook i don't know if anybody even has the textbook right because i don't think you need it with the notes that i have um the but if you hopefully you didn't have a new version anyway because the old versions are cheaper although sometimes not much cheaper if you take <laughs> the economics of textbooks are funny um so the textbook will tell you that net power is turbine power minus pump power and that's only true if you think about these things as absolute values. Um, in the first half of the textbook, it uses the hip to win sign convention, but it sort of drops that somewhere. There must be a paragraph in there that says, now we're going to see everything as absolute values, right? Because we don't want you to go to Home Depot and ask for a pump with a power of minus two horsepower because people will uh, look at you funny, right? But I believe that you understand what the signs mean, right? So I don't talk about it like that. I talk about it as turbine power, which is positive, plus pump power which is negative right if i wanted to find the heat rate in then i do a first law analysis on the boiler and if i can do those three first law analyses then i can figure out what the thermal efficiency is right and we did that in a previous problem right so the textbook will tell you that the thermal efficiency is turbine power minus pump power divided by boiler heat right but it doesn't put the absolute value signs there for you so I don't like their equations because you can't get them from the first law. So what I will tell you is that thermal efficiency is turbine power. See, this is color coded. So um, green for positive, red for negative. So I have a positive value plus a negative value, right? So my net power is less than my turbine power divided by my boiler heat. It is funny, right? Because I'm using red and green, um, which is the most common color blindness i think um my wife uh before she was my wife when we were just dating she was uh she used to fly the what are they called 
the Cessnas, you know, she was doing like a pilot's license sort of thing, right? So the little airplanes. But she's uh, colorblind, although I think they say color deficient now. She can't tell the difference between red and green, which meant she could only fly when it was light out. Because, um, I don't know if you've ever driven a boat at night, but it's the same thing. You've got a green and a red light on the nose and the tail of an airplane. You pass on the green side. You do not pass on the red side, right? Same as a boat. Unfortunately, green and red, which are like the most important colors, also for stoplights, it's also the most common color blindness, right? So I'm sorry that I chose green and red, but it let me tell you this story, right? Which maybe, you know, causes us to not concentrate quite so hard, right? <laughs> Take a break every once in a while. Right, so we can do a first law on all of these different components, right? But I'm kind of lazy or efficient. So I don't want to write out the whole first law for all of these different components. So I'm going to say that, um, well, at least some common assumptions I can make. Sometimes I say steady state. Sometimes components are one inlet, one outlet. Um, sometimes they're, I can neglect kinetic energy and I can neglect potential energy. It turns out for this four component Rankine cycle, I can make all four of these assumptions on all four of my components. And then I got to pick some of my components will be adiabatic, where I can cancel out the heat transfer term. That's like the turbine and the pump. So I'll get W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out. Some of them will be passive because the compressor or the, comp the condenser and the boiler, they don't have fan blades inside of them, right? So I can cancel out that power term. So I would get Q dot is equal to M dot times H out minus H in. Some other assumptions that I can write down when I'm doing these kind of um, systems is that we're going to neglect any kind of friction losses in the system. So even though there's tubes running around here that cause some kind of pressure drop, we're going to say that pressure only changes when it's part of the main thing that, that the system is doing, right? So the pressure changes, it drops across the turbine, it increases across a pump, but it's going to stay constant when we're um, transferring heat. We're also generally going to neglect any heat losses um, from the, the plumbing, the tubes that connect these different components. If we didn't do that, we'd have to do a first law analysis on like the lines that connect the components too. And it's just too much work for the, like it, it's, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, the juice is not worth the, worth the squeeze. So you'd have to do another first law analysis for all these little lines that connect the systems. But like the loss in heat in those different lines is going to be much, much smaller than say the net power. So it's not really going to matter when we're talking about the thermal efficiency. So we tend to neglect those things. But again, every time you make an assumption, right, you're, you're turning the real universe more into a cartoon, right? You're stepping away from reality a little bit. If you want the most accurate answer, you're going to include those things. If you have an adiabatic component, you're going to get W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out, provided you can make those other assumptions that we usually make, right? Steady state, no kinetic energy change, no potential energy change, one inlet, one outlet. Right? I remember this, right? Because Seven Dwarfs, hardest working people in all of Disney, and what they sing is hi-ho, right? So H in minus H out if you're trying to find power. You let the first law deal with the signs. And when you're trying to find net power, you add all the power terms together. Some of them are going to be negative, and that's okay. Your net power is less than your turbine power. If it's passive, and you're trying to ca cancel out W dot, so this is a component that doesn't have fan blades on the inside of it, like the heat exchangers, if you're trying to find the Q dot term, then you're going to get M dot times H out minus H in, as long as you're only worried about one side of the heat exchanger. What that means is you'll get these expressions for your turbines, right? So turbines are going to be M dot times H in minus H out. The way we label these is, is it, you know, it's kind of going around in this cycle. We start, state one is going into the turbine. We expect the turbine power to be positive because the turbine is producing power. 
The pump is also m dot times h in minus h out. That's h3 minus h4. But because power is going into the pump, we expect that power to be negative. The condenser, right? So that's the heat that's leaving the system. m dot times h out minus h in. h3 minus h2. Heat is leaving. Heat out is negative. The boiler, right, this is important. This is the denominator in our thermal efficiency. This is m dot times h out minus h in, or h1 minus h4. Now, how do we find these h values? Well, we got to fix the states. But the thing is about Rankine cycles, because a Rankine cycle, by definition, involves boiling and condensing fluids, when the when we ask the question what's the fluid the answer is water or maybe something like it you could set this up with a refrigerant or something where you're also boiling and condensing right so if i think about my thermal efficiency which is net power divided by heat in net power is the sum of all my powers letting the first law deal with the signs so i take a positive number plus a negative number so the sum is less than the turbine power but if I could do the first law analysis, making all those other assumptions, it's going to look like this. The turbine power is m dot through the turbine, h1 minus h2. Pump power is m dot through the pump, h in minus h out, h3 minus h4. The heat rate in is the mass flow rate through the boiler times h out minus h in, which is h1 minus h4. Now here's the beauty of this particular case. Because in this case, I have four components that are chained together in series. Every component is steady state. Every component has one inlet and one outlet. So that means for every component, the inlet mass flow rate is equal to the mass exit mass flow rate. But the exit mass flow rate for the turbine is the inlet mass flow rate to the condenser. The exit mass flow rate for the condenser is equal to the inlet mass flow rate for the, for the pump. And, you know, keep going around. So there's really only one mass flow rate in these systems. So if you have components that are all arranged together in series, each one is one inlet and one outlet, then there's only one mass flow rate in the problem, at least in terms of thermal efficiency. All of the mass flow rates drop out, and this is really just a function of the specific enthalpy. So it's nice in the numerator, right, uh, and the denominator, the odd terms are positive, the even terms are negative, and then we, uh, we just put it all together to see if we can get this thermal efficiency. So here I'm saying that this thermal efficiency is also equal to lowercase w plus lowercase w dot divided by q dot n, lowercase. Those lowercase values just mean we divide it by mass flow rate. So that's the power per unit mass flowing through the turbine, right? Or it's the heat rate per unit mass flowing through the boiler, right? Just means it's the same as delta H. So just a real simple, um, and I think we already did this, right? But if I was trying to find the thermal efficiency in this case, and I went through all, and we'll do an example when we get back from the break, so don't worry about it. We've already kind of done one example before, too, but the one we'll do when we get back from the break will be a little more in-depth, right? But here, if I know the H values, so this is into the turbine, out of the turbine but into the condenser, out of the condenser but into the pump, out of the pump but into the boiler, and then as we go from four all the way up to one, that's where the boiling happens, right? Remember how a watch pot never boils? You got to put a heck of a lot of energy by way of heat into this liquid to get to this steam, right? You go from like 200 kilojoules per kilogram to almost 3,500 kilojoules per kilogram, right? You got to burn a lot of coal right? or run a nuclear reaction. If we put all those numbers into this particular case, we get a thermal efficiency of about 55%. That means slightly more than half of that heat energy 
got turned into power or slightly less of that heat energy just got lost right because we have to cool the system down because we went from this low quality steam that came out of the turbine we had to cool it down in that heat at least right now we're saying that heat just went out into the atmosphere that big smokestack from the simpsons um, in real life we would put something because this is still usable heat so we'd use this for some other application right so that's a way that we can you know that's kind of how um green energy solutions or green products that work you know and get adopted by the market typically are taking the waste product from something and turning it into some other product right so here we have this waste product of heat but you can use that heat for something right? but that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we talked about but but we do end up using that heat for something right so the losses aren't quite as bad as maybe they look like from here Right, so this means uh, we have a thermal efficiency of 55% more or less. Right? The reason that um, it's that low is that we have to condense the fluid. And just like it takes a lot of energy to boil a liquid, it take, you have to remove a lot of heat to condense a liquid. And this is one of the reasons I think, and we'll talk about this a little bit more too, but if you look at... Um, Carbon emissions from the U.S. over the last decade or so, they've been going down. And most of that is because we're replacing coal power with um, natural gas power, right? So as we move to natural gas power, um, you don't have this condensation problem, right? So you don't, uh, you don't waste as much heat. So the thermal efficiency tends to be higher in natural gas power plants. Now, you got to get the natural gas from somewhere, right? So... Depending on where you live, maybe the talk of fracking and how we get natural gas is, uh, you know, maybe you're more or less familiar with that. But that's the problem with generating power is pretty much every way we know how to do it um, has downsides that are not um, negligible, right? So downsides that matter. So we, you know, the good news of that is that, um, you know, we're in need of smart young engineers to come in and fix problems, right? So you got some job security. Um. Another way that we can characterize these Rankine cycles or any kind of power generation cycle is by acknowledging that the power plant is the first consumer of the power from the power plant, right? Um, like we said, you know, when you're uh, starting up your Model T Ford, you got to crank it, right? So here we need to run the pump in order for this cycle to work, right? So we... Another ratio that we have, so not just thermal efficiency, we can also look at backwork ratios, right? Or BWR. BWR, backwork ratio, tells us what percentage of the turbine power is being consumed by the power plant just to operate the power plant. Right? So here you take the magnitude of the pump power divided by the magnitude of the turbine power and you get the backwork ratio. So if this is one inlet, one outlet, you'll get H4 minus H3 over H1 minus H2. I think that this is kind of the reason why coal engines, right, steam engines, were sort of the first thing that we made up in this, uh, or at least among the first things that we made up in, in this Industrial Revolution, right? Um, because... The beauty of these engines, even though there's a lot of problems with them, right, is that you get way more power out of the turbine than you put in in the pump. So here the backwork ratios tend to be on the order of a percent or less. So yeah, it's unfortunate that we lose a lot of heat because we have to condense the liquid. But one of the benefits is at least most of the power that we produce makes its way out onto the grid, right? It's not getting eaten up by the power plant itself. So this is another way that we can characterize um, how a power plant works is we can talk about this back work ratio. So that's saying how much of the power that gets produced is consumed by the power plant to keep 
right? So here, more than 99% of the power in this case went out onto the grid, which is a good thing. Um, we will stop there and we'll come back at 9.08. Move back to the slides that have four components. Yep. This is good. This one? Um, we'll get really used to these equations, but uh, you know it's definitely good to, to write them down. So the assumptions that we've made for all the components are steady state, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic energy change, no potential energy change, and then the turbine and the pump are adiabatic and the condenser and the boiler are passive. Uh, we'll come back at 9.08 and we'll go through an example of one of these Rankine cycles. Okay, thanks uh, for coming back, everybody. Um, we're going to go through this Rankine cycle problem. Um, this is sort of the last testable thing for the second midterm, is Rankine cycles. So open systems up to these four component Rankine cycles is what will be testable on the, on the second exam. This particular Rankine cycle problem is relatively complicated for the four component systems. I'm never going to ask you a problem on an exam that's as involved as the one we're going to try to do in the next half hour or so. But I could ask you a problem that has any part of this um, particular problem on it. right? So it's nice to know how to do these things. So we get this picture of our four component Rankine cycle, right? It's got a turbine, state one. So the numbering here is usually well, always the same. I kind of always joke that one of the things that I'm always tempted to do on exams is to just make this state one and see who understands what's going on and who just wrote down equations. But I haven't done that yet. So um, you're probably safe. Right? But here, we're, we're told this, we're told the uh, specific heat of this cooling water, which we might not need, at least not yet. We're given a lot of information for the states because here we have some information about an ideal turbine and then a real turbine. So from 1 to 2S, that's the ideal turbine. From 1 to 2 is the real turbine. Same with 3 to 4, that's the ideal pump. From th or 3 to 4S is the ideal pump. 3 to 4 is the real pump. Right? So we have isentropic efficiency information in this particular problem. Right? We're, um, we're told some information about the states. They were nice to us in this problem, although it might not look like it, because they totally fixed state 1 for us. They told us the mass flow rate of state 1. Right? Um, they totally fixed state 3 for us. They totally fixed state 2S for us. At least it looks that way. Uh, we don't know about state 2 and we don't know about state 4S or state 4. And then state 5 and state 6 are this cooling water, right? So maybe this goes out to one of those big Simpson-like cooling towers, right? So maybe that's where these lines are going to. Right? Um, we're asked to complete the TS diagram to find the thermal efficiency of the cycle, to find the mass flow rate of this cooling water. That's something we didn't explicitly talk about, so I'll show you how to do that. Um, find the back work ratio, right? and then track our assumptions. I think here, if you want the numerical answers for the states, then... Um, you can look through the notes, but I will talk you through how to fix each one of the states. Right? Um, I'll even talk about how to fix this state too, even though it's given for us. Right? But the first thing we want to do is draw a TS diagram. So remember, the TS diagram is really only talking about states 1, 2, 3, and 4. So just the water side of the boiler and just the 
hot water side of the condenser. Right? So this state five and state six aren't on there. So I ask, what's the working fluid in my Rankine cycle? The answer is water. So because it's water, I have to draw this T or this vapor dome on my TS diagram. Right? Now, this TS diagram is not the prettiest. Um, it's okay if your TS diagrams are not super pretty on your exams either, right? But remember, if water is the working fluid, you need to have a vapor, a vapor dome. The next thing that I want to do is I want to draw constant pressure lines. So I need to know how many constant pressure lines there are. So if I take the number of turbines, that equals 1. The number of pumps is also equal to 1. I take the maximum of these two, oops, that equals 1, and I add 1, that equals 2. This might seem like kind of a convoluted process in this four-component system, but this idea will hold true as we increase the complexity as well. So I need two pressures. I have some high pressure, and I have some low pressure. If on your TS diagram that you draw, you don't exactly know what the, what the, so we know the fluid is water. But I don't exactly know what the, you know, going into the turbine, I kind of expect us to be at worst here and probably up here in the superheated vapor region. So I'm going to draw state one over here, superheated vapor. State 2S, I don't know. Here on my drawing, you know, if I drew state 1 over here, it would definitely be under the vapor dome, my 2S. If I drew state 1 over here, it would definitely be up here in the superheated vapor region. I don't exactly know where that's going to be. And that's okay at this point. If you don't have these exactly in the right place, that's okay. You don't have to, like, go back and erase your diagram and fix it. Right? I just want to see, do you know the general shape of these things? You don't have to draw this on an exam, but I like to say, oh, turbine power is coming out here. The next thing that happens right, is we go through the condenser. Condensers, you want liquid coming out of your condenser. Right? So I'm going to take this line all the way over to the saturated liquid region. You want liquid? But you don't really want to cool it down much less than this because that would mean you're losing more heat than you have to. Right? So you only want to lose as much heat as you need to. So you usually take this down to a saturated liquid. This is Q dot out of the condenser. Then you have the, I guess this is 2S, right? You have the ideal pump that comes up here vertically up. This is 4S. And then you have your boiler process, which comes here, right? So this is the heat into the boiler. This is the power into the pump. But the, uh, the ideal process here was vertical. But the real process for the pump goes up and to the right. The real process to the turbine goes down and to the right. So state 2 is over here and state 4 is over here. So it's a little bit messy. It's not perfect. But this is kind of what a TS diagram looks like for at least a four-component Rankine cycle. So the first part of the problem is finished. For the next part, part B, we want the thermal efficiency. Thermal efficiency is going to be benefit over cost, right? The energy benefit is net power divided by heat rate in. Here I see there's two components that serve the net power. The first is the turbine power, which is positive, plus the pump power, which is negative, divided by 
this heat rate in, which is the boiler. So heat rate from the boiler. This one's also positive, so this is positive. That's negative. Right, so one thing that I can check is I can check that my net power when I'm done is less than my, my turbine power. Right? So this is great, but I really want an expression. When I'm doing the symbolic solution, I want the thing that I don't know, the thing I'm trying to find on the left, and a bunch of like H's and S's and stuff on the right. So if I wanted to get this, right, I'd have to do first law analysis, right? So this is DE by DT is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum of M dot in H in minus B in squared only over 2 or plus B in squared over 2, sorry, um, because it's metric. If it was uh, imperial, I'd have to divide by GC, although it's not going to matter here because I'm going to cancel this out. Uh, GZ in minus the sum m dot out h out plus b out squared over 2 plus gz in. Now this was me on an exam. This is how I would do the first law analysis for all of these components. I'm going to say for all components. I always encourage people to bring, it's Canada, I think we call them colored pencils, right? But here in the US, it seems like when I say that people look at me funny. So uh, pencil crayons, right? Um, bring different colored pencils and pencil crayons, right? Because you can tip yourself off on the signs of stuff, right? Or you can do this, right? So for all of my components, I'm going to say that they're steady state, one inlet, one outlet, and I can neglect kinetic energy change and potential energy change, right? So for all my components are going to be steady state, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic or potential energy changes. Then, for my turbine and my pump, they're going to be adiabatic. Unless the problem told me that there's X amount of heat loss from a turbine. And for... my boiler... I'm going to say that it's passive. Notice I don't even need to do anything for the condenser yet. Right? So here, this means for my, if I'm trying to find W dot, this is going to be M dot H in minus H out. And if I'm trying to find Q dot, it's going to be M dot H out minus H in. That part makes sense so far? Let's just keep this. Here so we can remember what's going on. So, so far, we knew that our thermal efficiency was my turbine power which is M dot of the turbine times H1 in minus H out, H2, plus M, I expect that to be positive, M dot of the pump, H3 in minus H4, that's the outlet. My boiler heat is going to be M dot of the boiler times H out, which is H1, this is 4 over here, minus H in, which is H4. Now these mass flow rates. For the mass flow rates, i got to do for all my components, dm by dt is equal to the sum of m dot in minus the sum of m dot out. But remember, for all my components, they were all steady state, 1 in, 1 out. So all my components, m dot in, was equal to m dot out, and they're all in series. So I'm just going to call this m dot hot. Because there's also this 
cooling water mass flow rate, there is an m dot cool in this in this uh, problem too, but that's going to be this cooling water. m dot hot is equal to m dot one is equal to m dot two is equal to m dot three is equal to m dot four. That means all these mass flow rates are the same, and my thermal efficiency is equal to H1 minus H2 plus H3 minus H4 divided by H1 minus H4. This is at least the symbolic solution for part B. And I'm going to leave it there because I think that the, you know, that, that we talked about that 80-20 principle, right? You get the best bang for your buck when you're doing the symbolic solutions. So I'm going to do symbolic solutions for all the parts that I have, and then I'm going to walk you through how to fix all the states. Part C, the mass flow rate of the cooling water. If I'm trying to find a mass flow rate, there's a couple of things that I can do. One, I can look for some place where I know the area times the velocity divided by the specific volume. That's the same thing as the volumetric flow rate divided by the specific volume. Option two, I can look for some component with more than one inlet and more than one outlet and do the first law. Option three, I can look for some component where W dot or Q dot is known, and then I can do the first law. These are really the only three methods that we know how to find a mass flow rate, or it could be given to us, I guess but then we're not trying to find it, it's just there. In this problem, there is no place where we know areas or velocities or volumetric flow rates. I do have a couple of different options though. I could go over here and if I knew the hot side, how much heat was coming out of the hot side, I could figure out how much heat was going into the cold side I could do this one, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to look at the whole condenser, which is a heat, oops, a heat exchanger. I got to write my first law down again. DE by DT is equal to Q dot minus w dot plus the sum of m dot in h in v in squared over 2 plus g c in. You know, I recognize, because I've written down this equation more than you have, that writing down this whole equation is kind of a pain. But I know that every time I write it down and I go through the process, it's easier for you to understand what I'm doing. So when you're writing your exam, and your job in the exam is to demonstrate your understanding, it's easier for me to know what you're doing when you start at this equation. Right? So always start at the base level of the equation, or at least write down the assumptions you're going to make. Right? So for the condenser, I'm going to say that it's at steady state, that it's passive because there's no fan blades. That I can neglect kinetic energy and potential energy changes. And here's the funky thing, right? The weird thing is that it's adiabatic. What that means is all of the heat that comes out of the hot side goes into the cold side. Right? That that none of the heat just gets transferred to the air. That all the heat loss from my hot side goes into my cold side. This is going to tell me that zero is equal to the sum of m dot in h in minus the sum 
of m dot out h out. That means that this is m dot 2 is an inlet, h2 is an inlet, plus m dot 5 is an inlet, h5, minus m dot 3, h3, minus m dot 6, h6. But I already did conservation of mass. It already told me that m dot 2 was equal to m dot 3, and I called that m dot hot. And if I do this on the cold side, it's also true. So this is the mass flow rates in on the cold side minus out on the cold side. But it's at steady state, one inlet, one outlet. What this tells me is that m dot 5, which should be up here, is equal to m dot 6, right? And I'm going to call that m dot cold. So instead of grouping these terms by inlets and outlets, I'm going to group them by hots and colds, right? So here, 0 is going to be equal to m dot hot, oops, times the inlet on the hot side is H2, minus the outlet on the hot side is H6, plus m dot on the cold side, this is going to be H, oops, this is not H6, this is H3 over here. This is H5 and minus H6 is over here. But this over here, we're going to say this is an incompressible liquid so that delta H is approximately equal to Cp times delta T. So this equation becomes 0 is equal to m dot H H2 minus H3 plus m dot cold Cp of the water times T5 minus T6. But the thing that I'm actually looking for here is this cold side mass flow rate. So in order to find that, I say m dot cold is equal to m dot hot. Now I move this to the other side of the equation, so this becomes H3 minus H2 divided by Cp times T5 minus T6. I could look at this and say, I know m dot hot, I know Cp, I know T5, I know T6, I think I know H2 I don't think I know H2 or H3, actually. We can go back up here and check. Oh, I do know H3, but I don't know H2. Right, But this would be my answer for C if I knew all the states, right? Just like here, I think what we know H2, don't know H3, no H... Or we, don't, we know H1, don't know H2, no H3, don't know H4. So we know the odds, but we don't know the evens. If we want the back work ratio, this is an acknowledgement that the power plant is the first consumer of the power plant. You have to take the power from the pump, or you have to take the power you generate from the turbine, some of it goes into the pump. We did the first law on these components already. We know that the pump power is m dot times h3 minus h4, m dot on the hot side. And we know that the turbine power is h1 minus h2. We'll take the absolute value. We expect that to be negative and this to be positive. These drop out. So this is going to be 
h4 minus h3, because this one's negative. So when I get rid of the absolute value signs, I'm going to just flip those around. Or if you ever do a backward ratio calculation and you get a negative number, just multiply it by negative 1. Um, divided by h1 minus h2. For this part of the problem, again, I know the odds, but I don't know the evens. This is for part D. So that's the symbolic part of the problem. And it's not like we did it super quick, but it takes a lot less time than fixing all the states. Right? So now instead of fixing all the states, I'll kind of walk you through the process that I would use to fix all the states. So normally for state one, we're going to know a temperature and a pressure. This is usually going to be a superheated vapor. And I would go to table A4. And I would going to get H1 and S1. Now, because this is an isentropic process, first I'm going to go to state 2S. This was another one that was given to us. Here we will often know P2, and that's it. But we know that S2S is equal to S1. So now I got to say, what's the phase? Typically, this will either be two phase or superheated vapor. How do I figure it out? I got to say, is S2S is it between SF and SG at P2? If yes, find X2S and use that to find H2S. If no, then superheated vapor. It's not going to be below SF, right? So if it's no, this is that uh, S g is less than s 2s then it's a superheated vapor and you go to table a4 and find h 2s now from this that's great but we have to find s do we have to find state 2 Right, so now we're going to use the isentropic efficiency of the turbine to say, okay, we know that the turbine power in the real case produces less than the turbine power in the ideal case. So m dot times h1 minus h2 divided by m dot h1 minus h2s. The mass flow rates are going to cancel. The two things you may or may not know in this case, right? You're either going to know the isentropic efficiency of the turbine and find H2. That's what this problem is. Or you're going to know H2 and we're going to ask you what the isentropic efficiency is. Right? So by the time you get to here, you'll know this. If you jump right to this part, then you'll see you didn't know H2S. And then you say, oh, I got to find H2S first. Right, so that's like halfway there, right? One and two. State three is, state one and three are usually the easy ones to fix. State three, usually you'll know P3 and you'll know that X3 is equal to zero. So H3 is equal to hf at p3 which is the low pressure you could also if you want say s3 is equal to sf at p3 but you don't usually need this and i'll show you why just like the turbine we want to go to the isentropic outlet first we know that delta h for an ideal pump is equal to the specific volume times 
delta p. So here, usually I want in minus out. So state h3 minus h4s is equal to the specific volume, usually at 3, because here I could pick off v3 is equal to vf at state 3. Usually about 1 over 1,000 for liquid water times p3 minus p4. This should be negative. This is going to be, in if it's metric, is going to be in meters cubed per kilogram. In that case, I want this to be in kilopascals, which is kilonewtons per meter squared, because then I get kilojoules per kilogram. But if it's in imperial units, then this will be in cubic feet per pound mass. My pressure is going to be in pounds force per inches squared. So I'm going to have to take 12 squared inches squared per foot squared. These inches squared cancel. This gives me foot pounds per pound mass, which is nice because it's energy per unit mass. But if I look up H in the textbook, it's going to be in BTU per pound mass. So I have to, oh, foot times L, foot pounds force times feet, right? So I got to take 778 foot pounds force per BTU. So now these cancel. So if this was um, in Imperial, probably I'm going to want this in cubic feet per pound mass, which is what it's going to be out of the textbook. This is probably going to be in PSI, and then I'm probably going to have to divide by 778. Right? But always check your units when you're using... The, if you're using this equation, units are important. Even in metric, because maybe your pressures are in bar or megapascals. But this will give you at least delta S or delta H for the ideal case. Then you can go to the real case, your thermal or your isentropic efficiency for your pump is going to be, it's always power over power, but here the real pump consumes more power than the ideal pump. This is going to be M dot H3 minus H4S. It's always the outlet that gets the isentropic notation. M dot times H3 minus H4. Here, I can actually kind of skip this, right? Or I can take this equation. Uh, let's say I call this equation 1 because I haven't used any other numbers. I could put that in here at this point, and I could say V3 times P3 minus P4 divided by H3 minus H4. In this case, again, the things that we're generally not going to know are H4 and the isentropic efficiency. Either it can be like this problem, and they tell me the isentropic efficiency and give me, um, and, and let me use that to find H4, or they can tell me H4, or at least enough information to find H4, and then I can use that to find the isentropic efficiency. Here, notice I need to have H3 is equal to HF at P3. But now I did this, and I get H1, 2, 3, and 4. And I know we went through this kind of quickly, but uh, H2 uh, and 4 are the ones that we didn't know. So if I know H2 and I know H4, then I can put those back into these equations and I can get values. So we went through it reasonably fast, right? Um, but this is generally how you do these four component Rankine cycle problems. On an exam, you wouldn't have to do all of this. I could give you essentially this same problem on an exam, but it would probably have 
more of this state table filled out. Right? So maybe I would ask you to find the isentropic efficiency of the turbine, right? But not the not deal with the isentropic efficiency of the pump or something, right? But if you could do all of this problem, especially with, you know, if none of this information here was given, then no matter what I ask you about Rankine cycles on the midterm, uh, you'd know how to do. So that was all that I have for you. If you do have questions, I don't mind sticking around for a couple of minutes. But otherwise, I hope you have a great night. And I will see you, on, well, tomorrow if you come to Office Hours. Right? Have a great night. Thank you. you too. Have a great Take night. Take care, everybody. Thank you.